everyone. Welcome to the Spicy Divorce Party Planner TV Show. I'm your host, Spice. And today we have a very interesting and unique guest by the name of Thomas Mandel. Hey, everyone. Okay. I'm going to give you guys the lowdown on Thomas. Well, he's a psychologist who specializes in relationship dynamics. Um, he was in a 12-year relationship and was recently divorced. Uh, he's been in a polyamorous relationship, and he has so many skills and talents that you guys are going to have to listen in to hear like all the different adventures and exciting things that he does on a regular basis. <laughs> it's a whirlwind, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thomas, can you tell us where are you... Where, what are you representing or who are you representing or what city are you representing? <laughs> um, myself. Um, I am actually currently uh, living uh, just outside of Dallas, uh, between Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, but here in about 24 days, I'm actually moving to New York. Oh, wow. um, so, yeah. So depending on when this comes out, I'm either representing Dallas or I am representing uh, New York. Awesome. I know you must be really excited to be moving to New York since they have so many fun things to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm moving there. I'm also a professional photographer. Oh. Um, and so um, I've gotten just since October, like it, it's exploded with opportunities. Uh, for me to um, to really uh, expand my photography business, um, and I will be continuing my uh, my therapy practice um, as well up there virtually. So. Oh my gosh! So you got all kinds of businesses going on. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's I, do. I do. That's great to hear for the new year. Mm -hmm. I've become unmanageable, and I've been uh, self employed for the past like thirteen years. I love so. it. I love it. <laughs> I'm trying to get that way. I'm doing like 12 jobs trying to get, get yeah. to that position, but I'm glad to hear that you're doing it and it's possible. Mm -hmm. Of course. Of course. It's, I mean, it has not been without its speed bumps, but uh, it's totally worth it in the end. Okay. So have, did you do anything exciting this past weekend? Yeah, I did. Um, um, it's always, so I grew up, I was a uh, performer, actor, singer, dancer. Um, and, um, uh, my aunt would always, um, uh, tell me the, the saying, like, how do you get to Carnegie hall? And I would answer practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. Um, and I ended up, um, uh, going, I photographed an event in October, um, and met, uh, Jessica Vosk and, um, she's uh, one of the best alphabets from, wicked like the best alphabet in my opinion oh. that's ever played uh, in wicked uh, on broadway and on tour um but her voice is incredible and she was putting on a show at carnegie hall this past monday um it's uh, judy garland's uh, centennial year so she would have been 100 years old oh, this year and uh, it was a tribute show for her oh my god and so yeah and so um so I got to uh, go to that, and so I finally, I finally made it to that's to wonderful. Carnegie Hall. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. um, that's a big feat. Yeah, and um, and while I was there in New York, um, I ran into Liza Minnelli, and um, she told me that my eyebrows were fantastic, <laughs> and I I lost my shit. <laughs> I don't um, blame you. Man, I would die just meeting her and then to get such a, a wonderful compliment. Like, that's an icon right there. That's so wonderful. Like, yeah. a person, huge name to meet in entertainment. Like, that whole yeah, event was... sounds really exciting that you got to be part of it. And, mm -hmm. and I exactly i talked to uh, my therapist this morning my own therapist um <laughs> about it and i was explaining you know liza's not just like a celebrity like she like especially her mother judy garland oh. um was instrumental in uh the the gay community um you know back in like the 70s wow. um and that's why you know we've got the phrase because you weren't allowed to like ask people straight up are you gay they would say you know are you a friend of dorothy oh. um as kind of a code because judy garland was so like intertwined uh, in our community as well as you know Liza so I didn't just meet a celebrity um I don't get starstruck but I met a historical figure who is still yeah. alive and someone who's so important to us so An activist as mm -hmm. Wow. Absolutely. No, I had no idea. I didn't I'm so I guess behind I didn't know that they were related. I didn't realize that was her mother. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I had no idea her impact on the gay community. That's that's just Iowa. Yeah. I had no idea. That's such a wonderful yeah. thing. 
thing to be a part of and to be a, uh, meeting people like that that are just always been pushing the envelope that's phenomenal mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah for sure yeah that's so wonderful mm -hmm. okay now that's exciting but i have a whole bunch of questions for you let's go okay all right so um why did you decide to become a therapist I decided to become a therapist um, because of accessibility issues uh, um, in uh, the mental health field. Um, my, you know, for frankly bullshit reasons, my mother was, uh, you know, forced to uh, go to uh, an anger management uh, thing that she was being shorted on her paycheck, and she raised hell about it. And you know, it was a uh, her, where she worked it was just full of men she was one of the only females if not the only um and she raised hell about it and, and they're like go to anger management she oh. went to uh this person and he told her that she drinks too much dr pepper what? and sees things only in black and white oh wow and that's it and didn't explain context of mm -hmm. like what black and white thinking is mm -hmm. um like all or nothing thing like didn't explain that just you see things in like and like completely unhelpful um and that's stuck with me um, because, you know, therapists like that fail people who, who, you know, who need them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do that. And I wanted to be accessible uh, financially uh, for people who um, can't, you know, who traditionally can't afford therapy. So I have several, I, you know, with, was fortunate enough when I was married to be in a position to offer, you know, pro bono, um, you know, sessions, um, regularly and also, um, like a sliding scale. And I still, uh, offer that sliding scale. Um, the pro bono sessions, I, uh, unfortunately can't do anymore because I'm not in the same position. I don't have, you know, There's two income in New York. Yeah. We got some, exactly. <laughs> some yeah. Big uh, bills to pay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have, uh, you know, I don't have two incomes, you know, coming in. Um, mm -hmm. and so it's very, um, very you know, I can't, yeah, I've had to limit that, but, um, but yeah, the, uh, the accessibility, uh, for mental health is super, super important to me. Um, and it's, it changed my life, you know, going to my first therapy session. Um, I didn't go until I was like 25 or 26. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. No, I, I I'm here for the people I've been thinking about that often is like, how do people who do not have like a big income afford to go to the therapist? And they're usually the people who need to go to the therapist the most. And I, exactly. I found myself too in the same situation. Like, how can I go if you don't work a regular job or if, even if you work a low paying job, how can you afford to go to a therapist? Like it sounds mm -hmm. great, but how can we actually go? So I, I love that you've jumped in and yeah. you're trying to make an avenue mm -hmm. for people that really don't have it available to them yeah yeah and it was hard for me to advocate for uh universal health care or medicare for all um oh, yes when i wasn't also offering you know accessible you know prices in the meantime and also insurance companies are pushing out you know mental health providers whether it be social workers or you know family therapists or psychologists that all of us they're pushing us out and like paying us less and less and less and so mm -hmm. i don't take insurance like we do re insurance reimbursements but like i don't i don't fuck with insurance companies because of that okay i, I get um, that i understand what you're saying that makes total sense yeah. okay. mm -hmm. um so what what so services do you offer um, so my therapy practice, I, um, it's kind of naturally gravitated more towards, um, uh, relationship dynamics. Uh, and so I work with, um, I don't do traditional quote unquote couples therapy because, um, uh, because I'm not a, a licensed marriage and family counselor or therapist. Um, uh, I'm a licensed therapist, just not, you know, that specific subset, um, and so I don't do quote unquote couples counseling. I do group therapy um, with people, but we mainly focus on the dynamics and roles that each partner, um, however many there may be, uh, the dynamics and the roles that each partner plays in the relationship and how we can make it more cohesive and harmonious. Um, and we do, you know, the things that, you know, uh, a couple of therapists will do, you know, I very much, um, follow the, a lot of the, the Gottman's, uh, method, uh, John and Julie Gottman, doctors, John and Julie Gottman in Seattle, um, that created the Gottman Institute. 
um, and the love lab and all of that. And they're, they're kind of our gold standard, um, in therapy for couples. And, uh, so we do follow a lot of that. Like, how do you, you know, talk to each other in the relationship and how do you, you know, prepare after rupture in the relationship and all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that being said, uh, relationship dynamics being, uh, my primary the focus just naturally is how it's gravitated. Um, and then I work with people, um, struggling with addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I work with people just, you know, your, uh, you know, anxiety, depression, uh, needing somebody to talk to, um, <laughs> going through an existential crisis. I mean, you know, look around, uh, um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, people going through a divorce. Um, I've worked closely with the LGBTQ community um, mm-hmm. as well. And so uh, really whatever somebody wants to come to me with, um, I don't, uh, I will work for people out. I don't work with like uh, uh, abnormal psychology. So like schizophrenia, um, I do work with a lot of um, people with bipolar okay. um, or borderline person- personality disorder. You know, things like that um but like schizophrenia and uh, um uh, uh dissociative identity disorder like things like that i will outsource to colleagues for sure and, and uh, eating disorders i mm-hmm. um will uh also uh, a lot of times outsource if, if the eating disorder is active okay so. Okay, well, that's great. And I can't wait to see more video. Well, not more videos because you don't do videos at this time, but more podcasts <laughs> on those different subjects. Because recently, um, mm. one of my friend's daughters, she posted a, a video or a clip on TikTok, and she said she had one of those disorders mm. that you mentioned. I, 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 which, yeah. which are the two, three different ones did you just mention? Mm, bipolar borderline personality that one uh, the borderline, borderline. borderline personality I, I didn't know what that is but, and so i'd love to hear like a podcast on that in the future yeah i will make a note of that i did forget okay. one i am also a sex therapist okay um that's that's the most important one um i'm also a sex therapist <laughs> i um i do help people individually through their um you know work through their different um, like hangups, you know, during sex or, uh, you know, erotic intimacy issues. Um, a lot of that is incorporated into the relationship dynamics and also working with, uh, people's kinks, um, and holding space for, um, for navigating that, uh, safely okay. and kind of like almost like teaching people like how to do, you know, this properly, and whether it be like aftercare and making sure that there's consent and negotiation all around and all of that. So, mm-hmm. Can't believe I forgot that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you cover a lot of different areas, which is great. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we need it so badly on our show, on <laughs> the divorce party show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, this is a question that a lot of people that don't have access to therapy and maybe are considering mm-hmm. it. It's a real question. What do therapists do? Because a lot of people they have these hangups. They're scared of therapists. You know, what do you guys exactly do, or how are you beneficial to your clients? Um, a lot of people think that, and, uh, and it, it's contextual. And so a lot of people think, you know, we'll just talk about individuals going into therapy that, um, it's going to, as Taylor Tomlinson would say, um, people think that therapy is going into uh, a room and having somebody say, you suck. Um, when really therapy is, uh, you going into a room and telling someone that I suck. Um, and then we listen. Uh-huh. Um, I, you know, I often joke and say that I'm a professional secret keeper, mm-hmm. um, because it is a safe space where we are literally required to, uh, you know, to, you know, keep, you know, your secrets to listen to you and not, you know, repeat these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but also to help you navigate through these, um, you know, these uncharted waters that, that you might be going through. Mm-hmm. If you think of like having like tangled up like yarn, uh, what we do is we, we find the end of that and we take it and then we like put it into a nice little ball. We organize it. We organ, we take your thoughts and we organize them for you so that you can really just kind of like stand back and look at your life or whatever the issue may be and go, okay, so this is what's happening instead of it all happening in like out of order and all of that. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like just the very general basic, you know, what we do. Um, we don't typically give, you know, we don't give advice. We will never tell you what to do. 
that was what I was we never, Okay. Yeah, we never tell our patients what to do. And so if the patient asks us, you know, what do I do? You know, dot, dot, dot. Um, we will go through together and I will typically ask the question, um, what would you naturally do? What would your first instinct be? And they'll say, you know, oh, I would just, you know, I would explode. I would go off, you know, pop off this on, you know, this person. And then I would like regret it days later. Okay, cool. You know, how has that worked for you in the past? And, you know, what do you think that you can do differently? Mm. And, you know, and so we, we help um, and assist our patients in kind of shifting their own perspective instead of giving them our perspective to look at something through. Um, and they're coming up with their own ideas. Um, we're just helping kind of facilitate that. Okay. Yeah, that, that's great. Because I, I was wondering, like, how do they exactly help? Because um, I've been to counseling, and I, I understand what you're mm -hmm. saying, but a lot of people, our viewers, they really, they're scared, like I said before. So, And yeah, I was wondering if absolutely. you guys just give them a straight-up answer. Or, but Okay, so you kind of help them navigate their ways. It's, yeah, and that's the most productive, is to uh, help them find a way. But it's you know we do sometimes run into you know you know i don't know what i would do like mm -hmm. you know they'll say that like i have no idea this is all i've ever known and what i'll do is i'll give options i'll say well you can approach it this way you can approach it this way here's a different way to speak to your partner okay here's a different way to ask for a need instead of saying you never do the dishes you're such a slob don't you think i want to um you know to rest at the end of the day too Mm -hmm. saying i'm feeling uh you know super overwhelmed lately with all there is to do around the house would you be able to take over the the dishes and the laundry this week you know that second sentence is you know you're stating you, what you feel you're stating the situation and then you're stating your positive request none of it is like blaming or degrading or you know anything like that um and, you know, it's little things like that. And my degree is actually in uh, neurolinguistic psychology. And what that is, is the words we use and how we use them and the effect that that has on the brain. And so instead of saying, you know, I'm intimidating, um, saying people are intimidated by me, it's subjective. Mm -hmm. um, instead of like owning up to that, you know. Um, and so it, it's a lot of reframing, rewarding things and you know, saying instead of, you know, saying I'm jealous of this and I'm envious of this, because those are two different things mm -hmm. that we often mix up and, yeah, and we'll get into that later. But uh, yeah, I had yeah. a question. I was like, I forgot what I was going to ask because I was so intrigued. Sorry. No, it's all good. <laughs> well, maybe I'll come back to that one. I was like, ah. okay. <laughs> uh, so I know you mentioned that you deal with the LGBT community. Do you also mm -hmm. deal with like the straight community or do you specialize oh, yeah. in just LGBT or? Um, no, actually, a majority of my patients, it's actually a, a pretty even mix. I mean, you know, who, who's straight anymore? I was going to say, like, uh, maybe they were straight, <laughs> now they're no longer straight. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that has happened. Uh, right. You know, I do help people navigate coming out. Um, yes. I do that. But, uh, you know, it, it is, it's a pretty even mix. Um, you know, it is part of the, you know, the... Um, the questionnaire and the the patient history form that i have them fill out before their first session okay. um and they can choose to answer you know their uh, sexual orientation uh gender identity all of that um and uh, uh that doesn't affect whether i take them on or not um as a patient and so it is it is pretty even for sure um let's see so how can we help people with addictions that is a loaded question. Yes. Um, like I need, I need an answer to that question. I have so many people that are surrounding me with addictions. Who knows? I might have one. Too, no. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with that, um, we have to first um, know and understand and really like feel it at our core um, that an addiction is a form of dissociation. Um, and, uh, you know, if we're just talking about substance use, um, addiction, um, the substances are never the problem mm. ever. Uh, they are the perceived solution to a problem. 
um, people are using substances to mask something or to fulfill something, a need that isn't being fulfilled or mm. to not look at something. Um, I often attribute it to like, uh, you know, don't look at the man behind the curtain, like pay no attention. Um, and the drugs are the, cur the substances rather are the curtain and you, you know, pull those back and there's the problem. Mm. um and you know and people don't want to look at that and you can be addicted to work you can be addicted to television to sex to substances you know including alcohol um things like that anything in excess that ends up affecting your life um and the people around you uh particularly in a negative way um is considered an addiction yes yeah, so that's what I was wondering, like, because, like, I know a lot of people that are alcoholics, and I'm like, is there anything we can do to help them? Do we remain friends with them? Or should, mm -hmm. what is the best thing we can do for them if we know they ha they're dealing with alcoholism? As long as they aren't hurting you, and as long as you aren't um, negatively or excessively negatively connect, um, affected by, um, uh, by their actions um you know when they're drinking um what we can do is again understand that their, their drinking isn't the problem it's trying to cover up a problem and so blaming them or shaming them shame is one of the leading causes of mm. um of uh, of addictions especially substance use including alcoholism um Goodness. and the difference between guilt and shame is guilt is i did something bad shame is i am bad mm. so shame grows from guilt okay. um but guilt does not grow from shame so um if people you know if you i'm gonna uh, rewind chat. that to get to fully of course <laughs> of course on, yeah feel free to that. take notes <laughs> yeah of course yeah um if people are you know constantly being berated or being uh, chastised if they feel chastised um for their addiction um, or if they feel, you know, attacked or you know, shamed, um, like, or judged, uh, for their addictions. Um, if somebody is addicted to something, you know, they, and, you know, I, I was also addicted to a substance. I was addicted to cocaine. Okay. Um, and I got real good at hiding it. Mm -hmm. I got real fucking good at hiding it. Yeah. Um, you know, chastising somebody for something doesn't teach them not to do it. Mm -hmm. It just teaches them that they should be ashamed of it. And it teaches them how to hide it. Hide it more. Yeah. And yeah. And so going up to, and this is very generalized. This is not specific. This is not to be taken as medical advice for anybody, listeners or you. Um, but for example, you know, if you're witnessing somebody who very clearly has a problem um, uh, with, with drinking, um, going up to them, so, you know, supporting them saying, Hey, you know, it, it seems like what you've been going through is, uh, I can't even imagine. I can't even begin to fathom, you know, how that feels. Um, if you ever need anybody to talk to, you know, I'm, I'm here. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, people have talked to you about your drinking before, mm -hmm. um, and how it might be a problem. Um, I know that it's not the problem. It's, you know, it, 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 it's not, I don't want you to feel shame for that. I don't judge you for that. Um, you know, whether it's a cry for help, whether it's a, a internalized, like I'm hurting and I, this is the only way that I, you know, don't hurt. I want you to know that while I might not understand because I've never gone through it myself, mm -hmm. I am a safe space for you to vent to or to talk to if I'm available. Um, and I'll do my best to make myself uh, emotionally available for you. And I will listen with the intent of understanding rather than listening with the intent of responding. Mm. Those two are very different. Um, and, you know, and just letting them know that they're safe with you because having someone say that when you are struggling with an addiction, you know, if it's that genuine, it, fuck i can actually go to them and talk about how like if someone is you know, does have an addiction they know they know it's a problem mm -hmm. they have a hard time admitting it out loud and even like it's like a fleeting thought yeah um but they feel that, it, that it's a problem they don't want to be doing it and 
if you make a safe space, they will reach out. Okay. Well, I've also encountered people that are kind of rude or mean, and sometimes I have to deal with them because they're friends or family. What can we do in those type of situations? <laughs> um, we have to uh, look at it and ask ourselves, why are they being rude or mean? Mm -hmm. Anytime anybody's rude or mean to you, it is almost 99% of the time, not even about you. Mm -hmm. um, they're being rude or mean because they're already, you know, ramped up and ready for someone to judge them. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, they're going to be on the defense. They're going to go into a situation every single time already being defensive because that's what they've had to be. Um, that's what they feel like they have to be. They feel so vulnerable. And so, you know, and they don't know that vulnerability is a uh, strength. Um, you know, a lot of times people are raised to believe that vulnerability is a weakness when vulnerability, according you know, from what Brene Brown tells us, vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And we're raised to believe that vulnerability is a weakness. Yet courage is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. <laughs> and we're raised to believe that that's a strength. Mm -hmm. And so, but vulnerability and courage are the same thing. You can't have one without the other. Okay. And so why is it that vulnerability is seen as a weakness? And, you know, courage is a strength. It doesn't make sense. Um, what you're saying. Yeah. And so, um, but yeah, so dealing with, uh, you know, people that are, you know, that end up lashing out. Um, you can see them not as the person is rude. You can see it as this person is lashing out. This person is in pain. Um, this person is lashing out at me. This has absolutely nothing to do with me. Even if they're calling me by my name, uh -huh. it has nothing to do with me. They're trying to make someone hurt the same in the same way that they're hurting. Oh. They're trying to bring somebody down trying because nobody's meeting them where they're at. They feel like they're way down here. Mm -hmm. everybody else is up here they're just trying to bring somebody down to not feel so alone mm -hmm. um and so we have to meet someone where they're at so if they're being rude to you be like i admire your passion to your cause <laughs> like i you know uh, it seems like you're going through a lot i'm absolutely here like let's go chill together if you want to if not you know whatever obviously this is all nuanced um but really looking at situations like that and trying your best not to take it personally would be the key to that. I have a question. So if we know friends are mm -hmm. alcoholics and they want you to go take them to get alcohol, should you participate or not participate? Um, that is uh, a time to set boundaries and to mm -hmm. practice your, your boundary setting. Yeah. Um, boundary setting is the, uh, you know, the, the penultimate form of uh, self-care that we can do for ourselves. And so if it's, and again, it's nuanced and um, it depends on the person um, and their situation. Um, me personally, I would, if they are in recovery, um, what if I they're would not, not in recovery? What if they're, they haven't, they're not getting um, if, help? If they're not, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm built a little different and I'll like approach them from a, like, um, again, it depends on if they're combative or not, or, you know, whatever, but, uh, I'll approach it from a, uh, stance of if somebody asks me, Hey, can, you know, can you drive me to go get alcohol? Is that the scenario that you're asking about? Um, or do you want to go out for a drink or, or yeah. something like that? Yeah. I, um, I just for me, I'm like, I drink socially, like here and there, but am I contributing mm -hmm. to their issue or I don't know where I, if should... they, if they have not admitted that they have an issue, if you're just recognizing that they, uh, drink excessively and that it's a problem, um, you can one choose to not go out you can always say no. Absolutely. Um, you can always say no. Um, you are uh, able to go, you know, out with them and maybe lead by example and say, I'm actually, uh, I've been drinking a lot lately. And this is kind of like backwards. It's kind of like subliminal uh, messaging, but like, I've noticed that I've been drinking excessively lately. And um, I'm really, you know, for myself, I'm trying to not drink, but I will sit here um, and, you know, and hang out with you um, if you want. 
again, depending on their levels. But if it's really bad, you can absolutely say, I don't think that's the best idea. Why don't we go to a movie instead? Okay. You can kind of deflect. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, because mm-hmm. I do encounter that on a regular basis with multiple people. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I just didn't know sure. to do in that situation. <laughs> Is it possible to stay with the person with the addiction? Depends on the addiction and depends on their the um, the addict's willingness to uh, to admit that it's a problem for one, um, and two, you know, are they are they hurting you? Are they treating you well? Are they treating you respectfully? Are they, you know, are they still contributing to the relationship? Are they showing up for you when you need it? Um, are they doing all these things? that are you know are basic needs in relationships um i would advise against you know with with anyone almost anyone i will preface that almost anyone breaking up with somebody solely because they have an addiction Mm. because what's that going to do that's going to say you're a bad person because you're you have an addiction Mm. and what does that do you're a bad person. What else is that? Shame. shame. I am bad. And what is shame is it is one of the lead, it is the leading cause of addictions. And so that would just be perpetuating it. It's yeah. kind, of, kind of counterintuitive. Um, but let's say you are a recovering addict and, uh, and your partner is, um, addicted to the same thing that you were addicted to as well, yet you're in recovery. If you're an alcoholic or a recovering alcoholic, let's say, and your partner has a drinking problem, that's not very supportive and it, it can end up being dangerous for you and cause relapse. That would be a reason to say, this isn't, um, this isn't safe for me mm-hmm. to be in. Um, that would be m- the first thing that comes to mind a reason to break up with somebody because of their unaddressed addiction now if they've addressed it and they are seeking help for it mm-hmm. that's completely different because you can support each other through that but if one side is completely like there's no problem you know just you know shot after shot um and then you want one like no absolutely not that's yeah. that's completely unsupportive and uh, that i would advise against or if they get violent obviously okay Okay, great advice. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, what can we do during times of anxiety and depression, especially during the holidays? <laughs> um, uh, it uh, depends on uh, and every answer that I'm give that I give is going to lead off with it depends. Um, but uh, let's start with anxiety. Um, a lot of times anxiety comes from uh, pressure. Uh, pressure creates anxiety. And so if you have pressure to, you know, I see this a lot in um, the LGBTQ community. Um, if you have pressure to see family members um, or to go to family that has not treated you the best, um, that it's completely, yeah, yeah, that's completely unsupportive. And, um, you know, if, you know, parents, you know, kicked you out and disowned you or, you know, even, you know, outside of the LGBTQ community, um, if you are, if you have ever been, you know, sexually assaulted by a family member and you see that you're forced to see that family member, you know, you know, once or twice every year, that's a problem. Yeah. And that is a time for boundary setting. If you have a, you know, if you have super, you know, non-conservative views and then your entire family or like even just one particular family member has like completely radical conservative views or vice versa whatever I'm not discriminating here. <laughs> exactly and if they you know consistently like bring things up just to you know stir the pot or to start uh, an argument and if you ask them that's this is a good time to set a boundary if you ask them what could i say that would change your mind on the subject and if they don't have an answer to that question um then it's time to set a boundary if you continue to 
um, to bring this subject up or if you continue to talk about this thing that I went through that I'm not comfortable talking about, especially in front of a bunch of other people at the time that we're supposed to be, you know, enjoying each other's company. And this is going to be the last uh, holiday that I attend and I'm actually probably going to leave now um, mm -hmm. if it's brought up again. Yeah. So a boundary is never telling somebody what to do. Okay. This is a big common mis misconception of, and because that turns into a rule. A rule is telling somebody what to do or a guideline. A boundary is if this happens or if this continues to happen, this is what I will do. This is the result of that. It's not a threat and it's not an ultimatum. You're just letting somebody know in advance this is going to be the, you know, the consequence or the result of X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. um, you're not telling somebody not to bring it up. You're just saying, I'm going to leave, and you're probably never going to see me again if you bring it up again. Yeah, I, I like your approach so, to that. Mm -hmm. That's a great yeah. way to handle that, and it's a great question that you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. I like I love boundaries. I'm obsessed with boundaries. Okay. And if you know the people that are that get upset at your boundaries are the people that benefited from you not having any in the first place. True. So. Very, very true. <laughs> mm -hmm. True. Now, what about the depression during the holidays? Oh, yeah. That. <laughs> um, depression during the holidays is caused by a myriad of things. Um, and, you know, it, even like seasonal uh, depression because, you know, there's less sunlight, you know, all of that, you know, vitamin D the deficiency, yeah. the rain, things like that, you know, snow being stuck inside, yeah. um, all of that. You know, that there's several things you can do. You can get sun lamps, you can get do um, like heliotherapy, uh, basically a, essentially a tanning bed um, to get, uh, you know, uh, kind of an artificial, um, albeit uh, vitamin D. Um, nice. But uh, if it is situational uh, depression, obviously, if you're going through depression, um, you know, find a therapist. Okay. Um, keywords to search. Um, if uh, if money is an issue, um, or sliding scale therapist okay. or pro bono therapist, okay. um, and um, you know seek help that way because it is so individualized. Um, but know that, and and this is something neurolinguistically that I I tell people, and I will tell couples this. I'll say you know you're going through a season right now in your relationship. This is a this is a lower season. And the reason I call them seasons, and you can apply it to individuals as well, you're just going through a low season right now because we're, you know, we're about to here in five or six days, uh, it's going to be winter officially on my birthday. Um, I'm a solstice baby, um, <laughs> but uh, I think it, um, it's going to be winter. We expect that. We know it's coming. You know, we know that, you know, in the fall, you know, the leaves start falling off the tree and in the winter you know everything looks a little barren and you know we everything kind of slows down a little bit and then in the spring we know what to expect we know that you know you know life starts you know emerging again and things start you know happening and growing and you know and that's why i like to call these seasons because we can expect them we can expect to go through seasonal depression or another depressive spell. We can expect to, you know, go through periods of anxiety, but we know that that season is going to change mm -hmm. and that, you know, spring is going to come. Um, and that we know a few months later, it, it's going to happen again, but then it's just a big cycle. Um, and we can expect it. What we tend to do is when we go into a depressive state, mm -hmm we think we've failed or we think we are doing something wrong. And then again, I am bad. And then we get shame yeah. from that. Um, and you know, we have to be okay with, okay, I'm, I'm depressed right now. I'm going to take, you know, allow yourself to sleep for 18 hours and not shower for two days. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. <laughs> that's, that's great. I hope I can say fuck on this. Um, yeah, you can definitely. <laughs> but it's uh, like, it, it, and don't judge yourself for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, don't judge yourself for having an anxiety attack. Social anxiety, if you just have anxiety about big crowds or like places where there's a lot of people. Um, one of my good friends, Dr. Robert Duff, um, 
in uh, in his book Talk Anxiety, uh, it um, he describes uh, the Kool Aid Man method, and I'm actually about to get a Kool Aid Man tattoo right here. Um, because if you uh, if you remember the old Kool Aid commercials where you know the big like Kool Aid pitcher would like bust through a wall and be like, oh yeah, <laughs> um, you know, no one has ever died. Yeah, the Kool Aid Man method. Of course. Yeah. Um, no one has ever died from an anxiety attack or a panic attack uh-huh. and armed with that knowledge. Um, when you're met with like social it, anxiety, times, you know, like let's it. say walking into it. Oh, absolutely. Yes, this is how you go. Um, but you know, let's say walking into a party or a bar or a club, whatever, a social situation. Mm-hmm. Um, anxiety is going to put this wall in front of you and say, mm-hmm for your safety, do not pass this wall. And it's just going to you know, build this right in front of you. Your brain will, will follow directions. It will do what you tell it to. Mm-hmm. Um, neurologically, it takes about four minutes for your brain to think that you don't want to do and for it to like comply. Um, but in your mind, break through that wall that that anxiety creates mm. and in your mind oh yeah like break through it like the kool-aid man um yeah. and that gives you a sense of power and the only way to like really the only way to get rid of anxiety naturally is to prove it wrong mm. look i attended this party and i was safe nobody you know judged me and if they did i didn't hear it and i don't care i love that because the other day I've, i was having anxiety and i usually don't have anxiety and i posted on facebook um because i live by the water and there's like a big storm and it really like terrified mm-hmm. me like i couldn't sleep i felt like claustrophobic so mm-hmm. i've been trying to deal with that on my own and like like i've done a couple things that you said like trying to deal with mm-hmm. it, like i've turned on the light i've taken some pills to sleep like some vitamins and stuff like that try to mm-hmm. exercise so i can sleep throughout the night but yeah it, mm-hmm. it's great that by saying that, that really makes me want to address that issue so I won't be as scared of it. No, <laughs> I was have you always terrified been scared of and I usually don't feel that way, but I really felt like anxiety. Oh. Interesting. Well, mm-hmm. it's, I mean, it's valid anxiety because, I'm, I mean, it's really hard to tell with storms, especially by the water. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to tell which ones are going to be, you know, safe or not because yeah. we're having more and more, you know, hurricanes every year, more and more floods yeah. every year. So it's not completely unjustified. Okay. Um, and I'm from Arizona, so I'm not used to all this water. <laughs> wow. Just pretend it's monsoon season and you'll be fine. Okay. Okay. You're right. You're, yeah. You were, li- you were in Arizona at one time too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I spent uh, some time in, in uh, Sedona, just you know, visiting. Uh, but my university um, was the University of Arizona. Um, it was the global campus, and so most most of it was uh, virtual. Oh. Um, and then because uh, a lot of it was, you know, during uh, I the tail end of mine was at the end of lockdown. Okay. Um, and so, uh, but like thesis and dissertation and things like that were in person. Okay. Um. So, uh. But yeah, I've spent a lot of time in Arizona. Okay. Love, good. Yeah. I, love I thought there. you went to school mm. in Tucson, but because that's where one of my good friends went to school too. Okay. So yeah, you, yeah, that's where the school is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, uh, Sedona is really pretty. Mm-hmm. Now I noticed in one while well, I was listening to one of your interviews, and you were mentioning disassociating. What is that? Uh huh. Dissociating is um, anything that pulls you, an action that you take that pulls you out of your current reality, um, whether it be, you know, uh, trauma related, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, not to bring up sexual assault again, but a lot of times dissociation happens in sexual assault. It's like, it feels, you know, it's described as feeling like leaving your body or just like completely just like, you know, it's like the power goes off. Mm-hmm. Um uh, addictions are a form of um, dissociation. People pleasing is a form of dissociation. Um, so I- anything that creates a uh, anything that derives from a fight or flight, freeze or fawn response um, is a form of dissociation. It can be you know daydreaming. It happens a lot. I have severe ADHD. It happens a lot with me if I don't take my my meds, my little arm floaties. Um, uh, you know, just it can be daydreaming. It could be like binge watching TV shows. It could be you know excessive you know video games where you all of a sudden like abnormally aren't you know connecting with the people around you. Okay. Um, 
because of something like anxiety or, you know, whatever it may be. Again, dissociation is not the problem. It's your brain's response to a problem Mm -hmm. um, because it's trying to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn more about dissociation, uh, this book, uh, um, What Happened to You by Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah. Um, It's actually a transcript of um, their audio book. Um, and it reads like a script, like the text is like blue and black, uh, depending on who's speaking. Um, and Dr. Bruce Perry is a trauma, um, a trauma specialist. Um, like he worked with the kids, um, that were born into and spent their young adult lives or young lives at, um, like the Branch Davidian, uh, the cult in Waco, oh. um, like, like a super traumatic things. Like he is the trauma specialist and no. in this book really takes um uh the narrative and shifts it into like let, let's say a kid lashes out in school and the teacher you know comes up and just immediately like punishes or like go to the office or like what's wrong with you um and instead you know if, in that situation if the the teacher like puts their hand on on his shoulder like to check in and then the kid you know blows up um and then the teacher's like, We're office, whatever, punishment. Mm-hmm. Instead being like, okay, I see that you, you know, just, you had a, a strong reaction to that. Uh, do you want to, uh, I'm, you know, I know it's not about me. Do you want to come talk to me or to someone um, about it in person? You know, what happened? Why? Be curious. Like, why did that, that, that outburst happen? Okay. Um, and it really like shifts the, the thinking behind it's like if someone's being a bitch at starbucks to a barista <laughs> like like in our minds we're gonna be like what the fuck yeah. is wrong yeah exactly. um, <laughs> but uh instead and being like what happened to her what what happened like in her life or what's happening in her life that's causing her to not have compassion for other people like mm-hmm. and just it 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 really teaches us how to have a curiosity about ourselves. Like, cause we always think what's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, what happened to me? Why am I re- responding this way or reacting this way? Mm. So it's a great book. I highly recommend it. I, re- I actually recommend the audiobook version, um, because it is a conversation yeah, between the two I'll of check them. that out on, what is it? Amazon or one of them? Uh, yeah. Audible. Audible. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. I'm gonna have to check that one yeah. out. Yeah, for sure. Not to advertise for them, but I I love this book so much. (laughs) Okay. No, that's good. (laughs) We all can get some help. I usually like to listen to books as I'm driving around, so that would be a great one to Mm -hmm. do. Absolutely. Um, So how can we deal with fear? I think you've kind of touched on it. Mm -hmm. Um, What kind of fear? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I just said, how can you deal with fear? (laughs) Okay. Um, So... Uh, if you picture, let me draw it, um, an upside down triangle. Mm-hmm. Um, here we go. So upside down triangle, right? Mm-hmm. You have brainstem, hypothalamus, limbic system, faint, limbic, and then the cortex. So we have the brainstem, hypothalamus, uh, limbic system, and the cortex. Anything that ever happens to us, ever, like every single like millisecond of our lives passes through this, you know, this sequence right here. If something, if our brain considers it to be, um, you know, dangerous, it's going to stop right here at the limbic system because this is just an information highway. Uh, the brainstem hypothalamus controls like breathing heart rate and voluntary actions. And this is the survival system. This is the often called the reptilian brain. Um, it's what, uh, it's, you know, the cortex is what separates us from animals. Okay. Um, it's in charge of, um, uh, logic. It's in charge of sense of time. It's in charge of short and long-term memory. It's in charge of like math. It's, it's you know, all of these things that, you know, that make us human um, if something traumatic happens to us or something seemingly traumatic happens to us, it's going to stop at the limbic system and it's going to keep a mental note of this is how we survived that. So, um, 
you know, let's say, I'll go back to the example of the student, the teacher that put my hand on the shoulder. Let's say that student um, was, you know, physic is abused at home, like physically assaulted at home. Um, and uh, the teacher, uh, you know, just lightly hand on the shoulder just to check in limbic system. Even though that situation isn't happening, it's similar. The brain is dumb. It's yeah. similar. Um, and so it's like, how do we survive this? We, we fight back fight or flight we fight back mm. um and so once we recognize you know why we respond this way to things because our brain doesn't know the difference between being chased by a tiger or having to answer a phone call yeah <laughs> like, anxiety is a weird thing mm. um and so once we can throw something up in the cortex because let's say you're held at gunpoint uh, in your car. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of times people will say like time felt like it slowed down, like everything was in slow motion or I completely blacked out. I can't remember a thing. Um, it's because it didn't make it to the cortex. Mm. It stopped at the limbic system. And they, you know, put it in a filing cabinet and this is how we're going to survive this next time. <laughs> and usually that's a fond response. That's an, an appeasing of people pleasing, you know, you know, here, you know, I didn't mean to, you know, whatever. Um, sometimes people, especially more emasculated people, will, you know, that'll trigger a fight response. So um, once we, in trauma therapy, we'll take, you know, these reactions and responses, put those in the cortex, that way logic can be applied to them. Um, and we can perceive a phone call as something safe and not being chased by a tiger mm -hmm. um, through methods like, uh, I have phone anxiety because I grew up in a generation of prank phone calls. And, you know, you, you want me to answer a phone, the thing that killed Drew Barrymore and scream? Oh. Absolutely not. <laughs> like, no. Um, but if I have my AirPods, then I can make phone calls all day long because my hands are free. Okay. Um, and I can do other things. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I'm trapped in a phone call if I have, if my hands aren't free. And that's just me personally and something that I found works for me. Mm -hmm. And that's how I can apply logic to it. And now I can make phone calls, okay. but so things like that is what we'll do in trauma therapy for sure. And how we address fear. So, okay. I like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay. We definitely need therapists. <laughs> I'm like, wow, your explanations and the, your, the way you guys go about things. I'm like, we definitely need therapists. Like, <laughs> I wish they're more accessible, like you're mentioning, because mm -hmm. so many of them are trying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, we really need them. Uh, okay. So now we're going to talk about polyamorous relationships. Um, Yay. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Let me go back. I have one question for you. We need to do a check in with you. Are you okay after your divorce? How long has it been? And how are you doing? Yeah. The divorce was finalized um, October 26th. This um this yeah year? this year uh, oh. uh -huh. um october 26th and that happened to be um was going to be uh the 12th anniversary of um me and my ex-husband getting together like of our first day oh no um yeah and it was right after i photographed my first red carpet event in new york and i got the the email on the plane um with the uh the papers being finalized you know from from court he went to court and had them and signed it all that day oh. um and i got that on the plane and then uh by that time i was having all these job offers you know for photography coming in and i hadn't even considered moving to new york so those were happening and i got off the plane and one of my best friends was like i just accepted a job at eastman school of music in new york mm. um then nice. i'm anxious about finding a roommate Oh, and I was like, Oh, good. Huh. Oh, that's good. And like all of these things within like an hour of each other, um, started happening. And I'm not one to, uh, you know, ignore universe when it's, you know, literally slapping you across the face with signs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's nothing really holding me back here in Texas anymore. My whole family's here. I'll, you know, most of my friends are here. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's nothing really holding me back. You know, I can still come visit always. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, that's the reason I'm moving to New York. But I'm fucking thriving. I fulfilled a childhood dream, um, you know, this past Monday. Um, I've done more yes. travel al alone, like solo travel, than I have in my entire life. Okay. Um, after the um, 
the you know the breakup while we were waiting on the the waiting period for the divorce um i went and um uh choreographed and uh photographed uh, a music video for uh alinario uh, one of my favorite um artists uh, i drove from dallas yeah i mm-hmm. drove from dallas to california um i've never been on a road trip alone mm-hmm. ever mm-hmm. and i was in my marriage was very codependent we would never go like on a trip without the other we would never like go on a road trip without the other like everything was done together we went to massage school together um you know we we worked we worked together. we met because he was my manager and three days later after i met him i just started massage school he enrolled at the same massage school and then you know we both graduated opened up a um two spas together in dallas you know had those for seven years you know everything was was together there was no separateness so it became super codependent I, um, I think that i'm surprised that you're doing so well that sounds for me that'd be difficult to go from transition from being together all the time to now by yourself it really took me it, it that road trip had a lot to do with it um, because I was fucking terrified. I was shaking for the first like three hours of the drive. And it's a good, like 26 hour drive. Mm-hmm. Um, I stopped in Sedona on the way. That was my midway point. Then I stopped in, uh, stayed with a friend in Reno. Um, and then you know, drove to California back and forth from there. But, um, yeah, like doing that was so terrifying, but I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. and what did i say earlier the the quickest and best way to uh, combat anxiety is to prove it wrong and i had almost crippling anxiety about going there yeah but i did it anyway and i had such a it was a liberating time i listened to god i lost my voice because i was singing you know all these songs i'm also a singer um i was singing all these songs like these painful like i went through all the emotions alanis morissette beyonce all of it i know you listen to uh, all the songs that i like oh alanis morissette was my <laughs> song like in high school like yeah mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I went through <laughs> yeah yeah and it's uh it was very it was super therapeutic and i proved to myself that i can do all these things alone i can i never would have even gone to california to have that opportunity had i stayed married i would have stayed in the same routine um and i never would have gone up to new york to photograph that first red carpet event that got me all these new opportunities had i still been married i wouldn't have gone to carnegie hall i wouldn't have met liza minnelli had i still been married i get um i see what you're saying he my ex-husband is now um engaged uh to uh to my ex-boyfriend still you know now his fiance um who was the the person that we that we brought into um our relationship oh wow um and uh they are now engaged um about almost a little under a month after the our divorce was finalized um it it hurt a little bit um it was because you know the ex-husband told me that um you know that you know very recently that he wasn't interested in remarrying wasn't interested in you know all of that mm-hmm. it's not something that i needed reassurance you know mm-hmm. he can do whatever he wants mm-hmm. um he decided that it was a good idea to tell me personally which i can i can get he didn't want me to hear it from somebody else mm-hmm. um but also i also didn't need to hear it from him Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate the um, the effort. It, m- it might not have been easy mm-hmm. um, to to tell me that, but I don't. Uh, it's not something that I needed. Um, but uh, yeah, so they're engaged, and I'm excited to see what's next for them. <laughs> um, and they absolutely deserve each other. Okay. Um, so I'm 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 happy for them okay. for sure um am i is there a little bit of bitterness yeah I mean, there was more there, <laughs> yeah, there was you're more human, right <laughs> yeah i'm human and there, yeah. there, there was more like when when he told me it was the sunday after thanksgiving that he told me oh, okay. um and uh so yeah there was a little like but i think that was more shock than yeah. than anything um and they've only known each other for now 11 months or you know here's actually 
what is today the 15th tomorrow will be the year anniversary of them meeting oh. of our of, of our first date together the three of us um is tomorrow so they have known each other exactly a year and you know got engaged you know 11 months after knowing each other i don't care love does not move at the speed of convenience it moves at the speed of love okay. so if that's what they feel um uh, what that's what's best for them i i'm not part of their lives anymore mm -hmm. i while i am allowed an opinion um I have no control and all I can do is hope that they both end up happy. Mm. Um, really nice holding to on to. Yeah. Yeah. You're a bigger person than most of us. <laughs> but, I just no, know what holding on to, to it all. I mean, you sound like you dissected it all and you handled it mm -hmm. pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. And, it hurt, and uh, uh, this is not to say like, I, I'm not proud of some of the things that, that I've said, you know it, privately you know to people uh -huh. um there have been some really like bitchy like like petty you know moments um particularly like when i you know had to move out of the house um that and that happened to be on our wedding anniversary oh nice. um yeah combined those two dates um yeah and uh that was a really hard day for me i said some things that i you know i probably shouldn't have um but i'm also you know, allowed to have, like you do. Yeah, it's yeah yeah i'm allowed to have those emotions um yeah, definitely. and uh it, and i own up to them and At least you know you i throw a brick through the window or something <laughs> just like, <laughs> i didn't set the yard on fire I didn't, right yeah. so you handled it pretty well compared to some of us <laughs> yeah <laughs> you did pretty good so mm -hmm. i was going to ask you since once again, going back to the polyamorous relationship, um, do course. you think that it affected your marriage in any negative ways by being involved in a polyamorous relationship? I think it accelerated what was already going to happen. I okay. think it accelerated what was already there. It, it, okay. Polyamory cracks, it, especially if you go from a monogamous relationship or monogamish relationship uh -huh. and um, <laughs> then open open that relationship up to um, to polyamory. You have to be prepared to, you are no longer, like the relationship that you had, the monogamous relationship that you had, no longer exists. Okay. It no longer exists. You are in a completely different relationship dynamic now. And it's so hard, especially when two people have been together for so long. It's so hard to let go of the the routines and the mannerisms and the you know the dynamics of what the relationship once was. And so polyamory, you know, as far as going monogamous to consensually non-monogamous, uh, in particular, will crack open, wide open your relationship and it will expose all the things that like that we have blinders to mm -hmm. um in in relationships and that's all it did there was nothing there um as far as me and my ex-husband were concerned me and my ex-boyfriend his fiance uh you know had had our issues we were we ended up not being compatible mm -hmm. at all um but it was the, well, the issues with me and my ex with both your partners or just one <laughs> um his fiance my okay. ex-boyfriend okay yeah um oh okay so and compatible. okay yeah we we ended up not being compatible okay and um uh instead of and, and i don't mean for this to be to be a read or for this to be uh a, a judgment um because i'm so glad that they have each other now i'm glad that my ex-husband didn't have to go through a period of being single i'm glad he didn't have to go through that that pain and that like he didn't have to navigate that he always had somebody there to um to be there for him to hold him to you know all of that he did and there there was there was a void but it wasn't the same kind of void um you know my uh, my wish or like the thing that i have since forgiven um and for me forgiveness is letting go of the hope that the past can still happen differently um was that like when uh his fiance and i ended up uh you know not working out and then that really started the rocky like you know three days later and that's when uh ex-husband came to me and asked for a divorce oh my um 
yeah, that's true. It, that was really painful. And yeah. um, if I were in um, my ex boyfriend's uh, position, I would have taken a step back and been like, yo, mm-hmm. <laughs> let me back up. Let me let y'all, you know, work on your you know, relationship. Um, you know, do whatever you need to do, reconnect with each other. Because mm-hmm. that's a big issue of what wasn't happening is I was feeling neglected. Um, and, uh, you know, y'all work on each other, y'all reconnect with each other. That connection has been like, you know, completely unplugged. Um, and then, you know, I'll come back, you know, when, you know, you know, when that happens, um, that didn't happen. It was very much, a, I, I got you now, is what it felt like. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I'm so glad they have each other now. Mm-hmm. it's i have no animosity again i'm i'm thriving and i i almost want to to thank them mm-hmm. um you know for teaching me all these things because i learned how utterly codependent i was um mm-hmm. i learned that my addiction was stemming from that codependency mm-hmm. okay um oh. and you know and and that addiction ended really weird like you know, t- towards the end of the relationship, they approached me about it, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's when it ended. But it was already you know too late by then. That was only like a few weeks before the divorce conversation. Um, but you know, I've had zero cravings since then. Um, and you know, and again, that's why well, substances that's are not yeah. the problem. Yeah, so it kind of helped you out. Well, I mean, it did help mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Absolutely. My grandmother told me the other day that. Uh, for the first time in years, she looks at me and it looks like the lights are on in someone's home. Aww. And that's, and that was that, I don't know if she knows how much that meant to me because yeah. I also feel that way. That's great. I'm I'm glad that you're able to re- evaluate all of that and then make peace with it and not be like really mm-hmm. angry. Like some of our um, viewers. And <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Like, I want I want those people to be angry at the situation. Like I I am still angry. Yeah, of course I I get like or I get spells of anger all the all the time about it. Yeah, because you're like, making I'm, a I'm, lot of adjustments. You know. Yeah, I'm pissed mm-hmm. off as fuck about it, but yeah. I'm also grateful for it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's you know, and we we didn't have kids, so you know, when kids are involved, it's it's absolutely different. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can either choose to hold on to resentment and anger and stay where I'm at. That means that I'm still holding on to that codependency. I'm still dependent on him and them for how I feel. True. And I'm, they no longer get that privilege oh. um, they no longer hold that power over me and when i reali- once i realized that i actually realized that at a um uh, a concert or um, a set that my best friend anthony uh took me to um like two weeks after the divorce conversation it's um an edm group um it's a it's three djs it's called above and beyond mm-hmm. and um and uh anthony and uh my ex-husband and i you know we all all three of us bonded over um over this group and um they ended up coming to Dallas. and i was like happy birthday i'm going to see a button on the day um guilty about um but we were, anthony was uh, like the the pillar of support for me and still is, uh, you know, throughout the divorce process, mm-hmm. he was consistently there for me. Um, he's, he is my best friend now. Um, and I was standing there at, at this show and, um, they played a song called happiness amplified. Um, and I just stood there and cried. Uh-huh. Um, one of the lyrics is this is the end. This, this is the end of my night of fear. Um, you know, this is happiness amplified. This is reality starry eyed. Um, now I can and, that song out. <laughs> oh, I'll send it to you. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I was just sobbing. And then a couple of days later, like I had that song on repeat. And a couple of days later, I was at home. Um, and I was uh, 
doing everything I could, like all the tools that I know how to use. Like I was trying to meditate and I was like, fuck it, let me turn this song on and try to meditate. And I felt this euphoria that I've never felt before, Mm -hmm. um, wash over me. And I just started like laughing, crying, like happy crying, like this, Mm -hmm. like, like I asked my my therapist if I was having a manic episode because they kind of like freaked me out. Uh, <laughs> um, but she was like, "No, you were having a breakthrough." Mm. And something I tell people all the time is, you can either break down and stay broken down, or you can break down and break through. Mm. And th- that was my <laughs> what Glennon Doyle calls um, uh, uh, a bathroom floor moment, like where you just lay on the bathroom floor and you just let it all out and you just like you you stop and that was my bathroom floor moment and i you know that's the song that i turn on if i need uh to be you know lifted up and i have anthony to thank for that um and it's uh i think you were going to ask me something about music and how that's helped me and that's that is one of the main things that has helped me is music for yeah, sure yeah music i mean it's really phenomenal and there's so many studies on it and how it really helps people in their moods mm-hmm. yeah it is pretty magical if you ask me yeah absolutely and like people like india re okay. um and okay. uh india re uh alienario and uh Naco and medicine for the people above and beyond odessa like mm-hmm. i had um uh, with, um, I actually, I have a boyfriend. Um, <laughs> and, um, and he has uh, a partner as well. And so it's really cool going into a relationship, um, where you're both already polyamorous. So you don't oh, have yeah, to, a, so you know, you're, you're open to polyamorous again. It is. Oh, absolutely. Polyamorous is so not the problem. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, okay. People always blame polyamory, and uh, and I'm like, the, you know, these things happen in monogamous relationships okay. as well. It's not yeah. polyamory, so yeah. Um, but going into it, it wasn't a monogamous, and then you know, changing that. It was it's you know polyamorous from the start, and there's so much communication, so much freedom and liberation in it, and autonomy. That's the big thing. Is there's so much autonomy in it? Um, I can go out to a bar. Um, or I can go, you know, to my mom's or I can go to New York. Like Monday I went to New York by myself and I didn't feel guilty about it. I didn't feel like I was doing something bad. Okay. Um, and that is, I, I can't even tell you how refreshing that is. Uh-huh. Um, but it's wonderful. But, um, if someone were to ask me what my happiest, like what my happiest recent memory is, um, or the happiest I've been ever, um, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, a couple months ago, so probably maybe generally, I think maybe August or September, probably August, um, we went to an Odessa concert and it's, um, uh, it's house music and lots of like visuals and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge like lighting person. Like I love, uh, I love lighting, um, too. lighting visuals and sound, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Dallas hadn't had rain in almost six months. Mm-hmm. Um, and Odessa had to, and the concert was breathtaking and it was like, I, like I dropped my knees several times, um, during this show. It was incredible. It had like drum lines with EDM music and I love percussion. It was everything that I love. I'm getting goosebumps now. Um, (laughs) No, it sounds really exciting and fun. But the, the part that turned it into one of my happiest memories is they had to end their set early they didn't apologize. Like we didn't know that they ended the set early. Um, they did the you know finale. They just skipped a bunch of songs um, because there was a storm coming, oh. and it was a it was a big storm. It, it there wasn't lightning. There wasn't like thunder or anything. Actually, there was. Mm-hmm. There was a big clap of thunder that like synced up perfectly uh-huh. with the lights. And we thought that it was like, like the thunder is a paid actor. Like we thought it was part of the show, but it was actually thunder. And wow. so we go out to the, and it, uh, mind you, we hadn't seen rain in six months. Dang. And all of us were just like riding this high from this beautiful music. And we go out to the, uh, you know, to my car in the parking lot and dancing in the rain. Dallas ended up flooding that night really bad. Oh uh, <laughs> but like a word dance, like I, 
I cranked up the music in my car, left the doors open. Oh, um, I got good. I got my camera out. I got one of the best, one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken right. um, of uh, my friend Devin on top of my car. Um, it was just, it was this collective like euphoria. And we were like basically putting on a show so for the rest of the parking lot. And it was just, there were all anxiety, all everything just like melted away. Like the, that rain was so cleansing. Nice. It was like, you know, people talk about being baptized. Yeah. (laughs) No, I'm jealous. I'm like, I wish I was there. I do like the rain. That would have been exciting. I'll send you videos. I took lots of videos. And I was going to ask, like, those pictures that you're saying you got your favorite pictures from there. Where can our viewers, can we see your artwork online? Is it? Yeah. um, My Instagram is Mundell, my last name, uh, Mundell Modern Pixels. Okay. um, Is the, the handle on Instagram and then my website is um is linked in the the bio on there and actually the the picture that i'm talking about is the the first picture that you'll see is the background on um on the header on the uh on the website so um but yeah that is one of my happy that was one of the happiest nights of my life yeah, um so much fun mm-hmm. and again i wouldn't have had it if i had you know if my ex-husband hadn't given me the gift of divorce yeah and i i, I believe that that um it is a gift for many people <laughs> mm-hmm. like someone just getting rid of that relationship you're like that was too much hell or, i'm not saying you're <laughs> with hell but it was, yeah. you know it's not always the best situation i have, mm-hmm. I have a different question um a, a friend of mine was asking is polyamorous because they thought polyamorous is polygamy where you have like two wives like a man has two wives but in your situation it's all males right so it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be male female male female right it, no, no. Polygamy is um, is religious and marriage based, oh. um, and it's usually uh, it's traditionally a man with multiple wives. Okay, that's all. You know, that's all polygamy is. And there's, you know, uh, it, it's not for me to judge. It's just not for me. Like I just got out of a marriage. I'm not interested in like getting into multiple. Yeah. Um, but polyamory is the is basically, you know, realizing that you know you are open to infinite you know love um love isn't high you know you can't you know you're not going to run out you know the more the more people that are around you what is finite is time Mm -hmm. um and so uh but yeah no polyamory is the the capacity to um be involved with multiple people romantically okay to date multiple people to have nesting partners that you live with you know whatever there's so many different branches of polyamory um and not and i'm not going to say that you know in polyamory that jealousy doesn't exist um but you start to develop a sense that jealousy is my favorite emotion actually um it's an invitation to pay attention to something like what's beneath the uh the jealousy and so I get excited, you know, when I feel that I'm like, oh, what needs to be addressed? You know, what's usually, it's usually from my past relationship that, you know, something is being triggered um, that I can work on. Mm. Um, the difference between envy and jealousy, though, is envy is wanting something um, or wanting to do something that someone else has or is doing. Um, so if like someone like went on a trip, you know, people say, oh my God, I'm so jealous, like looking through like, their photos from Cabo or whatever. Um, actually, no, you're not jealous. You're envious. Mm, okay. But we've gotten rid of envy uh, in in our culture because it is one of the seven deadly sins in the Bible. Um, and so people, and so just as a society, collectively, quietly and slowly, we have started turning the word jealousy and applying it to envy and making it cute. Like, oh my god, I'm so jelly. Like, uh-huh. no. Mm-hmm. we're gonna we're gonna stop that um because it's it's envious no I'm, I'm envious of your trip um and that's not a bad thing um jealousy is a is fear-based it is the fear of um of uh losing someone typically romantically um or like a friend or something to someone else it's the fear of being you know abandoned it's you know all of that because of you know someone or something that's jealousy and so it's very like it's very pointed um but most of the time when you hear somebody being jealous it's actually them being envious and you can absolutely feel envy and polyamory um 
But the beautiful thing about polyamory is it requires communication. Um, and so you, you know, if you are, you know, with people that have already accepted polyamory and hopefully are also in therapy, um, <laughs> then they're, you know, they are safe to talk to you, to go to and say, Hey, you know, this, you know, made me feel a little neglected. Um, this is something that I've been asking for, you know, or that's something that I previously asked for and it, it hasn't happened yet. And, you know, I, I've been patient, but then I see you, you know, doing this thing that I asked for, for somebody else. So, it, you know, knowing that you do have the capacity to do it, is it just me or is it, you know, something like that, um, is where healthy, like envy can be communicated and, uh, polyamory gives you a safe space to do that for sure. Okay. Once again, I'm going to have to go back and rewind that so I can like digest all that. <laughs> I hear you of and course. I'm getting it, but I got to hear that again. <laughs> so yep. I fully understand and get it. Would you be angry if your partner went behind your back and slept with someone despite you being open to um, polyamorous relationships? So does that make sense? Is that possible? <laughs> It is uh, nuanced. It is nuanced. Um, but no, I would be mad if uh, he didn't send me a video of it. Ah! <laughs> so, uh, all joking, all joking aside, um, it's um, it's things like that that you negotiate um, in a polyamorous relationship. Um, there is uh, uh, a branch of polyamory called uh, polyfidelity. It's a polyfidelitous relationship where, let's say, like a throuple, like uh, three people are all romantically involved with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and they are all, you know, for lack of a better word, monogamous with each other. Like they don't, yeah. you know, play around or sleep with anybody outside of that. Okay. Um, and then there is, uh, you know, what what we have is a, is a V structure. And so my boyfriend is uh, the hinge partner mm -hmm. because he's dating me. And then he's dating his other partner. Okay. Um, but his partner and I are, you know, you know, we're he's one of my best friends. Um, you know, I love him to death, but we are not dating. We are not okay. together. Um, you know, we, there's been no sexual activity between the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, all that, you know, it's kept separate. Um, and that's, you know, perfectly, you know, copacetic. You know, some people just don't have the capacity, like the emotionally, mm -hmm. to. Um, to date, you know, multiple people to be able to like divide their time um, and energy and attention to multiple people, and that's absolutely okay. He's actually uh, my boyfriend's partner is monogamous, is not polyamorous. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it gets, Your boyfriend's partner. It gets confusing. Right? No, mm -hmm. I, I get yeah. it. I might not um, so, him, but I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so he doesn't. He's he's not interested in being polyamorous. But he's absolutely 100% like cool with and okay with and like embraces wow. um, my boyfriend being polyamorous. And because, you know, I also create a super safe and, um, you know, if he has questions about it, I will answer, okay. um, you know, because it, it is a safe environment. It's, it's great. It's a, it's a great dynamic. Um, you know, they're both moving up to New York with me. Nice. So, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, and there's, you know, there's a lack of jealousy there. Mm -hmm. I don't have to fear that I'm going to lose my boyfriend to to his, his partner because, you know. Well, what, it, if that, what if your boyfriend, if he just steps out of this V that you described mm -hmm. and decides to sleep with someone like, say, uh, at a party or something, would you be upset about that? Cause he didn't, he no, did it no, 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 because oh, that's what I was getting at is, um, uh, is, uh, negotiate. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, is negotiations. Okay. Um, does negotiations come, um, uh, you know, talking about things ahead of time, like, okay. You know, when I was in New York in October, um, you know, I had the, you know, opportunity or the option, um, to, uh, to go, you know, sleep with somebody. Um, and I, you know, sent a screenshot, um, to my boyfriend and I basically asked for permission. Okay. Um, and he told me at that time and he was, uh, he was like, I don't, I don't, you don't need to ask me permission. Okay. He's like, if you have the opportunity to sleep with, you know, this person or this person or whatever, um, 
go ahead. I, I'm excited for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I told him in return, I was like, and then I took it further. I was like, do you want to know about it afterwards? Cause these are important things to say and to ask about. And he was like, he was like, sure. You know, I don't have, it's not a requirement, but I would love to hear about it afterwards. Oh. Um, and that's kind of where I stand as well. Um, cause I know obviously, you know, he sleeps with his other boyfriend, like that, that doesn't bother me. And I know, you know, you know, I'm very sexually open, like sex is not something like I've slept with almost my entire friend group. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it's, so, yeah. And it's, uh, go ahead. So if he went on a trip somewhere else and it mm -hmm. wasn't with your V partners, um, yeah. so you wouldn't be upset. You would be, you, you would allow him to have sex with someone else just like you were allowed to mm -hmm. i ended up not having sex with that person in new york um but oh, i'll preface with that you um, did just or did timing it? didn't i did not uh, okay. because okay. timing didn't work out but okay. um <laughs> uh, but no i would not be upset that i would actually kind of expect it okay. um and but i do know that if i were to ask him about it he would be up for an honest about it okay good um and that's the beautiful thing what would piss me off is if he went like if you know we had a rule and this is a, a lot of polyamorous uh, couples have this rule is, you know, asking for consent or permission before going and sleeping with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then should that, you know, should that somebody not, you know, abide by those, those hard boundaries, those hard, hard rules in the relationship, that is grounds that is, you can actually cheat in polyamorous relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's, that would be a form of that because it's a pre negotiation Negotiated uh, guideline um, that you know this happens before this happens, um, and that's kind of what I help people uh, in relationship dynamic therapy to kind of establish is all these things that people don't really think about. Um, but there's also people like us that I'm like you know oh you're going to you know to a house party or like a circuit party like I with your other boyfriend. I completely expect you to be passed around or whatever. Like that, that's, that's extreme, but, um, uh, <laughs> like it's things like that. Like that I, I, uh, I find beautiful, you know, I find sex to be, um, uh, an, an expression. Um, and it's not a thing you do. It's a place you enter mm -hmm. and it's a place of safety. It's a place of, um, like exploration, um it's a you know to to love is to have to know somebody to be you know predictable to be stable and then eroticism um desire is to to want um you know that unpredictability that spontaneity that that excitement and those two things are you know the things that build uh, the two pillars that a relationship are built off of mm -hmm. and so you know if you know, by him going off and doing that, that's building that, like, that anticipation, that, like, uh, that air of, like, mystery. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I love that. And that builds a spark in our relationship as well. Mm -hmm. It's called compersion. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, um, basically the joy that I get from seeing my partner receiving joy from something other than me. Mm -hmm. And so it's that like what what people usually call envy or jealousy uh, um, is actually the opposite for me. Like I'm like that person is you know it's gonna get raunchy. That person is making my boyfriend's eyes roll in the back of his head. <laughs> Absolutely, like one hundred percent. That's that's I guess you could say that's really loving someone because you put mm -hmm. their own needs before your own, kind of in, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. just want to see them happy. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's like not everybody's like that. But you know what? I've had like, you're probably like my third guest who's been polyamorous. I, I don't know. That. Yeah. Is this like, is has this been around for a while or is this something new? I, I, this is a, you know, I didn't expect to have so many polyamorous people on my show. <clears throat> Are you ready? Yeah. I'm Polyamory ready. has been around way longer than monogamy. Okay. Monogamy is a fairly new thing. It's a, a, almost like 200 years old. That's it. Wow. Um, it used to be, we, we're a tribal species, right? Mm -hmm. um, it used to be, you know, the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. It literally did. Okay. Um, you would have somebody that specialized in weaving. You had somebody that, you know, usually the mother that would nurse. Um, you had somebody that would 
um, you know, sit with the baby while, while it slept. You had some, you teach the things, you, you know, do all that. Um, as a species okay are we good there we go. yeah it's like Our cutting in and out for cult. some reason i don't know why it does that i think we're okay now i don't know when it does, that, it does. we are good okay Monogamous culture as a species so basically um you know the the male or the father knew that he was leaving the cows in the land it's freezing again so, um you know the the male wanted to make sure that he was leaving the cows in the land to you know his actual like blood relative like his son or daughter whatever <laughs> um it became like contractual it became it's rooted in patriarchy um and then really in marriage was just contractual it was just business up until about the victorian era and then it became romantic and then um at the rise of the nuclear family um like in the you know 40s 50s and especially 60s um you know love became possessive mm. love equaled i i own you i possess you mm. um like i am uh you are you know i'm yours type type of thing yeah um, um and we have to ask ourselves why um because we're afraid we're afraid of losing uh you know someone that that we love uh mm -hmm. to someone else yeah imagine imagine a hallmark movie right a hallmark christmas movie okay if the uh the hotshot lawyer uh woman uh from new york city goes back to her like hometown in nebraska and she has to choose between her hotshot um lawyer boyfriend and then the you know and then farmer tommy you know next door that she grew up with um imagine if like Por qué no los dos? Mm -hmm. why not both mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> if everybody is consenting why not both it would be a 15 minute movie <laughs> <laughs> like um you know if everybody was like you yeah. know consenting and copacetic with like hey you know i'm secure enough in myself that i have things to offer um and i know you have things to offer her that that i don't mm -hmm. um and so she can have all these needs met and fulfilled i love that, that that's great you know let's you know we're a team cool let's go like end of movie roll credits <laughs> um, but we've we've created a culture around the drama of like love triangle mm -hmm. yeah so, and, for sure yeah, i i do believe that because um even being like a uh, part of the lgbt community I, I like in certain cultures like native american cultures like you're allowed to i think be gay and um Mm -hmm. it's two spirit people yeah yeah and, and it wasn't until christianity kind of changed that so yeah that's interesting that you said mm -hmm. it's been around for that long but yeah because I, I don't think a lot of people know about that or have discussed it mm -mm. yeah so. yeah no i mean if you look back in like renaissance history and um uh like uh, royalty and um in england just you know just to be uh more specific like uh you know kings had multiple like kings had a queen right yeah and then had multiple like partners Probably men on, and women honestly <laughs> men and women on the side like, i would think so and, and, it, and they were part of the court like they were part of like you know and it was very like open and known that like yes this is you know this is my my queen um but this is you know also you know these are people that i also spend time with you, mm -hmm. you know and whatever um because you know back then the queen was just meant to produce an heir <laughs> yeah um not necessarily somebody that um you know that they were emotionally connected to that still exists in the royal family that's why harry and Meghan went out mm. because you know the the heirs weren't going to be you know accepted um by the by the crown so mm. um there are people that have abdicated because of that uh, way of thinking mm. um 
you know, of Charles, Camilla, and Diana. Imagine, could you imagine if polyamory, especially back in the 90s, was m more widely accepted and known and we didn't have to be like underground and, and all of that? But, um, could you imagine accepted everybody? Yeah. Diana would still be here. Like, oh my gosh. Like, like it would, yeah, it would have solved everything. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah. And so, you know, when I make that point to people, it's, it's kind of like one of those like, like mind blown moments. Um, but yeah, that's one of our more famous recent love triangles is, um, Charles and Camilla and Diana. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did hear a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah. And now the queen consort is, uh, is technically a side chick. So. Oh my God. <laughs> mm -hmm. side chick. So, so side chicks don't give up <laughs> that is so funny do you believe people can be monogamous or is someone going to cheat um absolutely people can be monogamous um that's uh and i don't i know i you know i say a lot of things like oh, but monogamous okay like or like monogamy in this economy absolutely not like I, I make jokes about it because I can't. Um, but absolutely, people can be monogamous. Monogamy works for people, um, just like polyamory works for me. Okay. Um, polyamory doesn't work for people, just like monogamy doesn't work for me. You know, the, there's polyamory by lifestyle choice, and there's polyamory by orientation. Um, my entire life, I've never understood jealousy. Um, I've never understood like like the feeling of jealousy. I've never understood uh, really monogamy. It was more of a like this is what we're supposed to do. Like I didn't know that there was even a word for you know for what I I felt, and that word ended up being polyamorous. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, and it also felt a lot like you know people's coming out experiences. You know coming out you know on social media. Um, you know, with our, you know, our new partner, like, eh, like it was very, it was like a big deal. Um, and you know, a lot of people like rejected it. A lot of people, you know, it just like coming out as gay. Um, I was lucky enough to, uh, be born into a family that is, um, you know, super accepting, super liberal, super like leftist, like I'm going to say liberal or super leftist. Um, and so, you know, it's, um, you're you know, I never crazy. actually had, yeah, I think you're yeah, really I never crazy. had to come out. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I hear um, other stories and it sounds so difficult for other people to come out. So you're mm -hmm. really lucky. I don't know how many people are fortunate to have parents like yours. Yeah. And I don't, uh, and I don't uh, mean to like put monogamous uh, people down. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, cheating happens in monogamy um cheating happens in polyamory um it's just not as common because there's more communication yeah. um but also infidelity and cheating um we have to as a society stop looking at that as an end-all be-all of a relationship because infidelity is very very rarely if not never about the person that was cheated on we never ask about the the story behind it. it's what happened to you like we always just say you're a cheat once a cheater always a cheater like and that implies that people can't grow mm -hmm. um but like there could be so many things like it's it's needs unfulfilled it's you know a an issue in the relationship or in the marriage or or whatever it's uh low impulse control it's you know there's hundreds of different things that it could be that have absolutely nothing to do with the partner um and then again the underlying theme of all these negative things is shame so when that person does it is infidelitous if they're consistently infidel if they're having an affair that person is meeting a need that they're not receiving elsewhere mm. but it doesn't mean that it almost never means that the person that's doing the the cheating doesn't love their wife or their husband or their partner. It doesn't mean that. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it does, but you know, that's also an invitation to have a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but when, because we see love 
as possessiveness. Um, we see, you know, betrayal is absolutely a strong emotion. You can be betrayed and, you know, and be, you know, lied to or, or whatever. But, you know, if you want to make it work, open yourself up to have an uncomfortable conversation mm -hmm. um, surrounding why. And not a, why her? Tell me what? Like, <laughs> not that. Um, but just a, you know, what, also kind of like compassionately, and what was going through your mind? Like, what, what is the reason? And what could I have done differently? Mm -hmm. um, or what can I do differently? Um, or are you polyamorous by orientation? Do you think <laughs> what's polyamory? Here's a book. <laughs> like, uh -huh. um, you know, is this something that you could even to put it this way? Is this something that you could even help? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, and that's what polyamory by orientation is, is just like an innate, like almost inability to comprehend monogamy, mm -hmm. um, at, at an emotional level on like a, almost like an evolutionary level. Um, and so like, you know, you know, honey, you might be polyamorous. Um, and, and that's okay. We can explore that. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. But you know, I'm not mad at you for cheating on me. Um, I don't own you. You have autonomy. Yes, it's a, probably a vow uh, that, you know, that we took. It's a promise we made. And, you know, that promise was broken. I'm betrayed. I am hurting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I want you to know that I know you weren't doing this maliciously just to upset me. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been hiding it. Mm -hmm. You would have been like, I wouldn't fuck this, you know, blah, 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 you know, if you were trying to hurt me about it. And yeah. that, that, that rarely happens, but it does happen. Yeah. Um, and that's just that relationship <laughs> needs to end anyway, if that's happening. Um, but like, if they're hiding it, they love you. And that sounds gaslighty, mm -hmm. but like, they didn't, they're not doing this maliciously to hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. Being hurt is a, is a byproduct. Absolutely. And that doesn't need to be invalidated and that needs to be addressed for sure. Um, and remorse needs to, you know, hopefully there's remorse there. Hopefully there's like an, an open, honest, safe conversation surrounding infidelity. Um, a good book. If uh, any of your listeners are, you know, have experienced this um, or have like ended relationships or marriages over uh, uh, infidelity before is um, by uh, Esther Perel. Um, uh, e S T H E R P E R E L, mm -hmm. um, uh, Esther Perel, and it's called uh, mating in captivity. Um, wow. and it's a beautiful, beautiful book about the stories behind infidelity and how wow. a lot of times it's, it, it doesn't, you know, somebody cheating or being infidel is, doesn't take away from the love that they have from their partner, mm. their existing partner. Mm -hmm. um, and if we as a society can kind of uh, love the polyamory is becoming like there's a huge wave right now of popularity um, because it takes care of things like that. If somebody gets cheated on, finds out and approaches their partner and goes, Hey, so I found out <laughs> <laughs> that um that either you're having that you're, that you're having an affair with your uh secretary you know don't panic you know stop don't get defensive please listen um with the intent of understanding and not responding i want you to know that i'm not taking that personally i know that you are very clearly you have a need that maybe hasn't been communicated with me that's being met there and I know that maybe it's possible possible that I can't meet that need. Mm -hmm. um, I will humble myself um, to feel that. Am I hurt? Yes. Do I feel betrayed? Yes. Mm. Um, am I pissed off? Absolutely. But <laughs> yeah. I know because you tried to hide it from me for so long. Um, I know that you didn't want to hurt me. So you're, you weren't doing this to hurt me. You were doing this for you. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that polyamory exists 
mm-hmm. or that like you know what is this need can i meet this need for you if they want to stay monogamous whatever um can i meet this need for you is there something you know different that i could do is there something additional that i could do and if not i you know maybe i don't want you to stop seeing linda at the front desk mm-hmm. you know if, if linda makes you happy the big question is if linda makes you happy um i don't want you to stop seeing her but my question is do i still make you happy mm. and that's where the question that's the big question because if it's yes you still make me happy why these are the ways that you make me happy cool perfect let's explore this do i still make you happy no i am not happy in this marriage anymore okay that's the why obviously that's going to hurt but that's the why and then that can be is there anything i can do differently is there anything you know are we staying together because the kids are we staying together because the house are we staying together because we share a bank account are we staying together out of convenience what is this um if i don't make you happy anymore and whatever answer comes up you know you know convenience or kids or money or whatever um you know then that is you know a time to start talking about divorce because this is a divorce show I don't see divorce as a failure. Okay. I don't, um, you know, people always call it, you know, you know, and they're afraid to like announce that they're getting a divorce because they feel like they failed or they, they call it a failed marriage. Um, a failed marriage is two people staying together. (laughs) Yeah. um, Um, failed marriage to me is two people staying together unhappy for the rest of their lives. Yeah, being buried different. next to each other, two people that hated each other. That's a failed marriage to me. Whether they, you know, they could have been together 70 years. I don't care. We, we tend to measure the success of a relationship and longevity and how long it lasted. That's psychotic. Um, I, you know, and I measure success. Uh, I had a successful marriage that ended in divorce. That was a success. I was happy up until... You know, the end. Um, but, you know, we had a, a successful, productive, meaningful, exciting marriage. And we ended it at the right time before we started, you know, truly disliking each other. Yeah. When it gets to that point, that's where it starts failing. Mm-hmm. So divorce was the best thing that we could have done because there is a chance that, you know, I, I'm not ready to... Uh, to to be you know besties to be friends i probably will never speak to um to his fiance ever again mm. um just because uh um you know the i i don't that we do again we aren't compatible yeah remember you we said. just weren't yeah. yeah um we just aren't compatible and so you know i'll i'll speak in passing i'll say you know hey how's it going or whatever um but we don't have conversations um but with my ex-husband you know maybe you know someday you know if they come up to new york you know i'll i'll show them around town you know i'll take them to a broadway show or i'm not going to introduce them to liza Uh, (laughs) but they don't get the uh, liza treatment (laughs) they they don't get liza Uh, um, but you know there will come a time where i will be you know open to where that that pain button isn't going to be hit you know mm-hmm. every time uh, i see them especially together mm-hmm. um you know I, I joked with them and i was like so am i photographing your wedding or <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah you're really nice so, and, yeah uh, I'm i don't think i'm gonna be photographing their wedding <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, is it something about Princess Diana and her revenge dress? <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So you know, I don't holding on to grudges and animosity is like holding on to a hot coal, expecting the other person to get burnt. Mm. Um, yeah, you're hurting. And your I'm I'm yeah, I'm not about that. You know, I'm. I hope he's happy in the end and that he doesn't live to regret it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i wouldn't wish that on anybody yeah only time will tell i (laughs) yeah him and i I explained to somebody today that you know while at the in the moment at the end of our relationship i felt a lot of i felt pissed off (laughs) that that i 
you know, that you know, my ex-husband and I were did like 11 years of work. Like we, it was hard work that we did to better ourselves, to grow as people and to like build, you know, to our house that we had, like they still live in it. Um, I, you know, this, you know, I busted my ass to get that house bought um and to like make it a home and then you know and this was my perspective you know back then is you know and then this person comes in and reaps all the benefits of um of this thing that i worked so hard for this person yeah. d didn't do shit for yeah um now my perspective is and i was absolutely valid in feeling that mm -hmm. now my perspective is i did all this work you know and we did all this work my ex-husband and i you know for all these years um to become better versions of ourselves to become better people and i wouldn't be where i am he wouldn't be where he is he you know grew into a person that is a match that he grew into a person that someone fell in love with and that he could fall in love with that person as well mm -hmm. and now i see that as beautiful like it's almost a gift that i'm giving his fiance wow. <laughs> like like here's this person that you know i went through hell with and you know we held hands through hell and came out the other side you know better people and this is my gift to you you're welcome yes he did all his own self work and stuff but like you know we we grew into different versions of what we were in 2010 like and so i'm i'm happy for them um and i hope that they're m making the right decisions for the right reasons yeah um I'm curious how this is all going to turn out in like two years <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> uh, we'll see. i hope that I'm not wishing yeah, bad I, or nothing i'm just wondering how it's going to turn out but yeah yeah i don't know i mean statistically i obviously i obviously have my my professional opinions um and you know data and statistics to you know back you know things like this up but um i know that my ex-husband is not typical of of other people mm -hmm. he loves you know just like i do he loves hard fast and fully mm -hmm. and i will never blame someone else i will never make someone else pay for someone else not being able to love me properly love didn't hurt me yeah someone else who didn't know how to love me properly hurt me okay and i will always if i love somebody i will always love them hard fast fully mm -hmm. okay love doesn't move at the speed of convenience i remember you saying so, that. yeah so mm -hmm. yeah well we'll see how it goes hopefully it works out okay i love that how kind you are about the whole situation <laughs> Mm -hmm. i have to be it's it's exhausting being um being petty and while, while it is funny and it is like um it, it is satisfying uh temporarily to be petty like i said when i was hurt uh, more so i was like i said things that like i would not say today yeah um you know i called uh his fiance like a, a side chick like <laughs> uh you know i wouldn't i wouldn't say that today yeah um you know that's you know that's his fiance i could just say the other one <laughs> if i wanted to yeah. <laughs> but yeah so yeah yeah i'm glad that you you're able to handle that yeah and a lot of people do like um will smith and his wife and and mm -hmm. ex-wife so i'm like yeah it, it's great that some people do handle things differently and, and are mm -hmm. actually positive role models for a lot of us who come from dysfunctional household <laughs> <laughs> um what can we do when our partner's actions make us feel jealous like if they do something that makes us feel jealous are we supposed to check ourselves or mm -hmm. um if they do something that makes us feel envious we communicate it um we say hey um you know, I felt a little envious when, you know, when I found out you did this or when I saw you, you know, you do this. Um, and here's why, whether that be a, you know, I've talked to you about this. This is something that like I would like to do or, or like I want you to do for me. I saw you do it for somebody else. Um, I'm wondering, you know, is there, you know, is there a reason that that hasn't happened for me or, you know, whatever the hell. Um, communicate it. Have an uncomfortable conversation. If it's jealousy, if it's 
if it's that, it's absolutely look inward and say, okay, what am I afraid of? Because remember, jealousy is, you know, an invitation to look inward. What am I fearing? What am I, why do I feel like I'm going to lose my partner, um, you know, to this? Um, is it because I'm not communicating? <laughs> is it because they're not communicating? Is it because, you know, there are a myriad of reasons? It's nuanced. What if you solution to, or you already made them aware of a situation? So they're aware of it from the beginning and then, then they still do it. You make them aware of it again. You ask them, Hey, we've addressed this. Um, if this ha happens again, uh, I'm going to have to reevaluate my role in this relationship. Okay. Um, but until then I do want to give you a chance and maybe to remind you, maybe you forgot. Um, I do want to give you some grace in that. Um, but you know, I, I do want to let you know that, you know, while I love you, I also love myself okay. and I will be forced to, you know, for me, if this happens again, um, to assume that, you know, that this is, that, that I'm not going to whatever the situation is. Um, and I'm going to have to remove myself from this situation, either temporarily or permanently. I remove myself from this situation. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, when that happens, things can be reevaluated. Uh, but, you know, when we have cooler heads, we can talk about it together. Um, that's setting a boundary. If this happens, this is what I'm going to do. Okay. Yeah. So you're letting them know so yeah. explicitly, like, here's the consequences of your actions should you choose to act on them again. Mm -hmm. um, big fan of giving somebody grace. Um, you know, I'm not a definitely not a fan of yelling um at people and the reason that people yell is because they want to be heard um and they start talking over people and that's literally our volume goes up because we just want to be heard yeah. and so if people learn to learn active listening it's in uh relationship dynamic therapy and in couples therapy that's one of like the the foundations of um you know of productivity is you know having partners listen to each other with the intent of understanding listen to understand don't listen to respond if we listen to respond we're listening to defend ourselves we're listening to make the next point to be right if we're listening to understand we are stepping into our partner's shoes and looking out through the lens of their eyes at an event because you know a and b can exist it's not a or b mm -hmm. you know multiple realities exist because of perspective, the way I'm experiencing this Zoom call is completely different from how you're experiencing this Zoom call. Mm. And, the, you know, and it's completely different from, you know, the people that are, you know, listening to this. Mm. They have a completely different set of experiences happening surrounding it. True. And so when we get stuck in like, this is what happened. I'm right. What you're saying is wrong. <laughs> um, that's that shows like low uh, emotional intelligence because multiple realities exist. It's the evil or it's the A or B. No, it can be A and B okay. at the same time. No, I'm, that's why I'm glad we're interviewing you because I'm like, yeah, you're you're making me think outside of the box. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. I hate boxes, <laughs> <laughs> right? No one wants me to box. But yeah, I love that. Yeah, you're making me think about things differently. Uh, let's see here. Oh. Do people in polyamorous relationships, do they typically practice safe sex? Um, that varies person to person. And um, that is absolutely a, a conversation okay. um, that all partners involved um, and even like what I call extracurricular partners um, uh, involved need to be consenting. And that like that transfers over into uh, just sex sexual health and sexual education, which mm -hmm. we don't really receive, especially in Texas, mm -hmm. um, in public schools. Yeah. Um, what does safe sex look like for each individual? Does it look like, you know, having sex without a condom and then immediately, and then not having sex with anybody else immediately going and getting, you know, tested, um, you know, four to seven days later mm -hmm. and then not having sex with anybody until they get their negative results back that's a form of safe sex mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. 
you know, being on PrEP, the, uh, the uh, uh, HIV prevention drug, being responsible about that, either getting the injection every two months or taking Truvada or Descovy, if you have the name of the own, um, you know, one pill every day. Um, being responsible about that is practicing I'm, I'm sex. I'm discussing that because I have a friend who has HIV positive. I've, mm-hmm. I'm saying it correctly. And I didn't think, like, mm-hmm. oh, if you have AIDS or HIV, mm-hmm. hopefully I'm saying it correctly. I'm like, uh, I'll correct you, don't worry. Okay. I didn't know if they could still have sex with other people, but he mm-hmm. was. So I, I think there's mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people need to learn about that as well. I don't think it's talked about that often. Yeah, and so it's pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, while I'm going to make an assumption about your friend, mm-hmm. it's pretty medically straightforward. Um, if your friend is uh, responsible mm-hmm. um, sexually, um, either they are choosing uh, sexual partners that are verified, um, that are verifiably on uh, prep uh, or on dis- you know Discovery or Truvada or the injection um, consistently. Um, or your friend is uh, what's called undetectable. And that means that the uh, the viral load of HIV is so low um, mm-hmm. that it is not transmissible. Um, it is okay. not able to be transmitted uh, sexually through body fluids. Okay. Um, or your friend is using condoms. Mm-hmm. And um, while condoms can break, condoms are not foolproof. Um, you know, it is, there's, you know, those three things are versions of safe sex. Um, if your friend is uh, HIV, HIV positive um, and detectable, um, and then not verifying if their sexual partners um, are on PrEP um, and or not using condoms, that is irresponsible okay. for sure. They can absolutely still have sex, but it's absolutely so dangerous um, and uh, needs to, you know, not be shamed um but maybe your friend needs you know if that if that is the scenario needs uh just a little bit more education have them reach out to me if that is the case Mm -hmm. um the the last scenario um and uh, i'll absolutely you know give them options um to do there's free hiv clinics in every major city um that will you know get them on meds um that will allow them to be undetectable where they can have their sexual freedom back um yeah, and that's, that's one of the most liberating amazing, things amazing because like for like a mm. long time i thought like if you had aids that you just couldn't have any sexual partners so it's amazing so like, aids um aids is different from hiv yes yeah, um, that's what i'm saying HIV, i need a correction because i know i would get them confused Okay. AIDS is acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and HIV comes first. You get okay. uh, you you know people with HIV are infected with HIV, and then should the viral load um, you know increase, um, or if HIV goes unchecked, that will evolve um, into um, into AIDS, okay. and uh, nobody ever dies from AIDS. They die from AIDS related complications, so they'll get the flu. Um, you know. Uh, RSV or uh, a cold even or like COVID literally anything um, because it takes their um, T cells way down it attacks the the immune system of the body and so any kind of their immunocompromised so any kind of like illness could cause death Um, and so that that's AIDS so uh, while you know people absolutely you know still you know suffer uh, with aids nowadays these numbers are going down at such a rapid pace it's more so hiv uh, positive and negative people and that you know is clarified by hiv um and uh undetectable or hiv indetectable and typically people are getting tested every three months okay. for that so yeah that's good i mean that's yeah. progress to me absolutely yeah major progress. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay let's see oh do you think tracking our partner is okay like with the phone tracking google system mm-hmm. like yeah with, with, with consent for sure but with consent, um if it's yeah with consent absolutely um okay. one it could be a safety thing um if you have uh, an erotically open relationship um and you know and your partner is going you know over to have a hookup or going to a party um, it is safe to have their location to know where they are if you have it for the right reasons and to know where they are 
should you not be able to get a hold of them or should something happen, you know, at least their last known location. Um, and it's a safety issue. So, if, you know, hookups are usually, you know, a lot of times people that, you know, we're not familiar with. True. Um, and so, you know, people that aren't vetted um, or, or whatever, you know, always, you know, you know, ideally let, you know, somebody know, and your partners could be, you know, the best people to let know, Hey, you know, you've got my location. Um, you know, if I'm not back in, you know, three, four hours, you know, <laughs> call me or text me and see like what, you know, uh, what's up, see if I'm okay. That would be, you know, a, a responsible thing to do. And if you are in a relationship with non-judgment, um, where you're not going to be shamed or guilted or blamed for, uh, for doing these things that were previously negotiated that were okay, um, then you would have you know no problem, and everybody can have a safe experience uh, with that. And so yeah, as long as it's consenting, um, I absolutely believe that's okay. Okay, cool. Um, uh, oh, how would you handle a, a relationship where you told her partner that you? Do not want to be in a long distance relationship and then they end up taking a traveling job. Um, I would reevaluate why I said I wouldn't want to do that, um, okay. hypothetically. Um, you know, what is the uh, you know, what is the the hold up? Why wouldn't I want uh, a long distance relationship? Is it because quality time and physical touch are my main uh, love languages? Mm -hmm. Could be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is this a monogamous relationship where I wouldn't be allowed to have those two particular needs fulfilled elsewhere while you're gone? Mm -hmm. That could be a reason why I wouldn't tolerate a, a you know, being in a, a long distance relationship. Um, am I not allowed to go, you know, with you? I wouldn't want to. Um, but I mean, if they're moving to like, you know, somewhere cool for work or like a travel job or whatever, like, Fuck yeah. If you're moving to like London, I'm going with you. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but if you're going to like, you know, Dumbfuck, South Dakota, I'm not going with you. Yeah. Am I allowed to, you know, to have emotional uh, and romantic connections with other people while you're gone? Um, you know, there's, there's again, a number of things that you can um, negotiate with that. Um, if you absolutely love the person, they would, I, I hope, would you know talk to you and consider you mm -hmm. before accepting that job um but if not you know that's you know with uh with my situation with moving uh to new york you know i told my boyfriend um and basically you know when i told this that i've got these opportunities in new york and i'm going to uh, i i think i'm going to do it um i would love, love for you to go with me um, i think you know this would be you know an awesome like fresh start for everybody a really cool experience absolutely outside of our comfort zones i'm terrified um but also super excited um you know outside of our comfort zones but um if you don't you know don't go or don't want to go um i completely understand i'm going regardless okay. and and then i left it up to him i said i don't want to an answer right now that's a big question um you know a big thing to consider um i don't need an answer right now and you know think about it okay. and like collect yourself and then you know come back to me when you but again it's uh i'm going to i'm going regardless i would love to know what you would like to do um and that's you know and, and that shows interdependence which is uh, it, it lives in between codependence and radical independence. And it's interdependence. It's considering the other person, um, but also making really important life-changing decisions for yourself. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, when kids are involved, it's a little different. Yeah. So this is all just from my perspective. <laughs> That's true. Um, mm -hmm. I think we talked a little bit about panic attacks. Why do people have panic attacks? because their brain thinks they're in danger. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's plain and simple. Um, panic attacks, yeah, panic attacks are actually 
um, more chemically based. Um, it's more uh, hormone based than situational anxiety attacks or situational anxiety attacks are based on worry, based on like things like irrational things. Panic attacks are is the brain something like this short circuiting, and um, you know the brain thinks that you're in danger and the limbic system is kicking in sending you into either fight flight freeze or fawn um and uh the, the body is like going into like survival mode okay. essentially and my next question is so a thing to help with panic attacks yeah. actually um is cool. to is, uh, a polyvagal no that's for anxiety oh, for panic attacks okay. um you'll want okay. yeah you'll want to trigger a, a polyvagal response and um, a way to do that is to take the brain's survival part, um, the limbic system, and have it focus on something else. So um, take an ice pack, um, if you're at home, put it on the back of your neck, um, and then lay two more on a table, and then put your head down on the table with your wrists on the ice pack, um, because your, uh, your body doesn't want to take cold blood to the heart. Mm. Um, and uh, your body will register. We're freezing. One of Lav, uh, Laszlo's hierarchy of needs is heat. Um, you know, your body very much wants to not go into hypothermia, um, more so than it does want this like thing that doesn't exist to happen. And so it's going to focus more. It's going to divert its attention to the cold. Mm. Um, if you don't have ice packs available, um, you can. Uh, you know, in the middle of your panic attack, don't have someone do it for you. You have to physically get up and go get an ice cube out of the freezer, put it in your mouth, don't chew it, don't swallow it. Ice cube in your mouth, push it onto the roof of your tongue. It's going to hopefully cause a trigeminal headache, which is a brain freeze. And that's going to trigger, again, the vagus nerve to kick into survival gear because, you know, the brain is cold. That's not good. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, uh, taking a straw. If you have, if you don't have ice available, if you're in the car or something, I wish I had a straw around here, um, and uh, hold your nose and just breathe through the straw, your body's going to think that you have something stuck in your airway, and again, you're you're tricking the body into thinking that it's in more danger than it already thinks it's in, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's going to focus on that more so than the panic attack itself. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never heard of that. So, what is the difference between anxiety and panic attacks then? Um, an anxiety attack is uh, when you have irrational thoughts, like, oh my God, these people are, are all going to judge me. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to, um, or like this thing is going to be dangerous or this thing is going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to die or like this, you know, I'm on a ski lift and these cables are going to break and, oh. uh, you know, whatever. Um, a panic attack is, there's no thoughts behind it. It's just, it's literally, um, it, if you have a panic disorder, that's why you have panic attacks. And it's literally the brain, the limbic system is just kicking in, stumping, triggered it. Very rarely do we know what it was. Um, but your body just goes into survival mode, fight, flight, freeze, or fun. Okay. And no, and, and you can't, like, you don't have a reason. It's not like I can pinpoint, like, oh, it's because, you know, I was, you know, uh, you know on, on an airplane. Or, or whatever, and I'm scared of flying. No, that's anxiety, because you, okay. you have reason. Um, panic is, is more so just a chemical imbalance, wow. if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great to know. Mm -hmm. um, what should we do when we have them? But, okay, we already discussed that. Mm -hmm. What can we do if we are feeling depressed? And I think we talked about that a little bit as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. What should we do if a partner's beliefs are different than yours on keeping in touch with exes? Cool. Keeping in touch with exes. Um, how your partner talks about their ex is very important. Um, and that's something to look out for when you are dating somebody. Um, if they have nothing but contempt uh, for, their, for their ex and also it's not coupled with like, but these are all so the places where I fell short in the relationship, mm. then it sounds like, you know, you're putting all the blame of the, you know, unsuccessful relationship on them as if you did nothing wrong. Um, that could be considered, I hate this term, but that can be considered a red flag. Okay. Um, you know, in, in my situation, you know, I, you know, maybe someday 
will be in a place emotionally where I can be, um, you know, more than just cordial to my ex-husband. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, cause right now, like we're not friends. Um, we spent too much time, uh, together. Like we, I'm sure we still you know, love each other as people. Um, but just very much not in love. Um, you know, and we also have like logistic, logistical things that we have to like stay in touch about or whatever. And, um, but then like if somebody's ex abused them, uh, so, yeah, I just, absolutely. Like, why are you talking to them? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to get jealous about it, but I'm going to be like, what, what are you doing? Like, and why, yeah. um, you know, are you looking for that confirmation bias or, you you know, do you think you deserve what, you know, what they continue to give you? Like, why is it? Mm-hmm. Um, and then if it's just somebody like hanging out with their ex, if, you know, it depends on, again, the relationship agreements and what everybody's consented to. Um, if you trust that your partner, if they've shown that they can communicate difficult things or uncomfortable things or taboo things with you, you can ask them if they're going to go hang out with their ex, you can ask them, you know, are y'all going to have sex or are y'all going to, you know, is this a date or, you know, whatever. And if, you know, communication is there and honesty and authenticity is there, they'll either say, you know, yes or no. Um, and if you're not comfortable with, you know, if they say yes, if you're not comfortable with that, again, I sound like a broken record, communicate it. Like, I'm, that's not something I'm comfortable with because it does trigger a fear that you are going to go back to them. And I know that they are not comfortable with, um, with consensual monogamy and that, you know, does kind of instill a fear in me that I will lose you. Okay. Okay. That's, that's healthy jealousy right there. Okay. Um, if a partner has a Facebook page and they hide it from you, would you still remain with them? No. <laughs> right. right. What are you hiding? <laughs> the whole life, right? Yeah. And, and that, that's the, that's the operable, um, uh, uh, phrase right there is the end is hiding it from you. Yeah. No. Okay. Absolutely not. There's no, you know, clearly, you know, clearly I haven't created a safe environment, um, to make you feel as if you can let me know that you have a Facebook page or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, therefore, you know, we're not compatible. Yeah. Um, you know, if, you know, if this is dishonesty from the start, you know, I, I wish you nothing but the best, enjoy your Facebook, but you know, things are not to be hidden from me. And if I, you know, and sometimes it's just like, you know, and, and I see that as like, if I ask them, you know, do you have a Facebook page or if they're like active on it and like, and they're telling you like, Oh, I don't use Facebook. And I'm like, bitch with this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like, uh, yeah, that's no, there's no, you know, there's something in the relationship that isn't like, that's not mixing well um and i'll I'll be like this is probably you know not i would probably ask them like have i not created a safe environment for you to be you know authentic and honest with me Mm -hmm. you know that's part of active listening is asking questions like that to and that's not accusing Mm -hmm. and saying have i not created an environment where you feel like, you know, you can come to me about, you know, this situation. Um, and if they say, you know, no, then great. And if you've done everything you can to create a safe environment and they still say no, then, you know, we're not a match. Um, if they say yes, then dig further, like then, you know, you're super active on here and you tell me that, you know, you don't, you don't use Facebook yet. You're, you're using it here. Is there a reason? You know, are you, is there a reason that you're feeling shame behind using this space? Like something's being hidden from me. Again, I've created a safe space where you can literally tell me anything and I will do my best to support you in whatever that is. But if that understanding isn't, isn't there, if that confidence isn't there, we're not going to, yeah, I can create the safest and, and like most autonomous environment 
ever known to you know man and woman kind you're still not going to be honest with me i'm not going to participate in that for my own well-being nobody likes to be lied to um what if you, you know but if what if you haven't created a safe, safe space for them? Like maybe they're worried that you're going to. Mm -hmm. blow That's up where the them. question comes in. You know, have I not created a safe space? No, you haven't. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, in what way? Like what, what's your fear mm -hmm. that would happen? You know, if, if I find, if you know, I found, found out you had a Facebook or if you, you know, were openly using, you know, Facebook or whatever. Um, and depending on what that fear is like, Oh, the fear of backlash, fear of like, jealousy of possessiveness and you know i'd be like well that sounds like that's what an ex did to you mm -hmm. not me yeah so um i can absolutely like you can rest assured knowing that i'm not like that um you know i don't see you as property you can have you know social connections with whomever you want to mm -hmm. um and there's obviously if somebody's hiding a facebook page there's way more um there than you know than just like like i thought you'd be mad at me no there's like there's lots of that's a big old shame response right there and that's something to go to therapy about but um but if they say yeah no you you know you blew up at me you know when you found out about this um you threatened to leave me when you know when this happened or you you know i i feel like you're gonna abandon me when this happened okay um and if the, all those things are true then you know we're again we're not a match mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> um or absolutely thank you for like you know thank you for you know bringing that to my attention i had no idea that you felt like i would abandon you mm -hmm. um i want to do my best to reassure you that i'm not going to do that um you know and if i've said those things in the past like um i'm going to work on that uh, maybe in this relationship or my next one um but yeah if something like that that's why my answer was so quick to like no um because if something's so i'm gonna say innocent but something so like mundane is hidden mm -hmm. most likely there's other things hidden too that true you know that they don't even realize a lot of times when people hide things it's involuntary mm. um that's a good point mm -hmm. what what is a wellness index um, I was confused, right? When you sent me the list, I was confused by this question. Um, I don't... I, I mean, thought I heard several, you mention that in the interview, a wellness index. Um, a wellness index, uh, in a, by definition, and there's so many definitions of it, okay. um, is basically the steps that you take, um, the, the wellness and self-care steps that you take, okay. like, you know, you know, taking your vitamins every day, going to therapy, going to, you know you know, going, getting a massage, drinking water, like all that could be considered part of your, it's almost like a checklist. Okay. Um, sometimes people think of a wellness index as like an intake, as, you know, therapeutically, like, um, you know, like we have people fill out a PHQ um, and a GAD, uh, you know, just like an assessment for their, a very basic assessment for their uh, anxiety levels and depression levels or, you know, whatever, something that kind of points out that, okay, um, we you're, we're going to take a look at this or we're going to focus on this today or you know what so there's different meanings to wellness indexes um but basically it's how you're doing yeah okay. okay. I, I whether it be physically or mentally okay. uh now we want to know about your entertainment industry work but were you an actor mm. dancer yes um dancer singer actor um grew up in musical theater uh, um, and uh, I uh, did a show off Broadway um, with a yeah. touring company um, back in 2003. Um, I've uh, performed with a division of uh, Cirque du Soleil, um, Cirque Dreams, um, uh, and uh, doing aerial silks and things like that. I've performed with Six Flags over Texas, um, Amusement Park, and uh, in you know tons of musicals locally what? um yeah and i taught dance for years oh my as well <laughs> yeah like um todger call i don't know if you're familiar with todger call but uh him and i grew up um together uh you know dancing at scott hoying um who is uh, the blonde guy in uh, pentatonics oh, wow. um the acapella group um who and i grew up singing 
together um, at the same studio. Oh, uh, yeah, and so there's like, uh, you know, I know a lot of people, um, <laughs> especially that are like currently um, like big deals in the entertainment industry. Um, but when I got COVID last year, last December, um, or last January rather, uh, it triggered um, psoriatic arthritis and where i had to stop doing massage um and i uh and so it and i haven't been i haven't danced since like i haven't been in the studio since and really since lockdown um you know i was uh, helping choreograph a show at a theater around here i was helping choreograph uh, matilda the musical and um our opening night was supposed to or what was supposed to be our opening night was the day that um the city of Fort Worth, where it was, had to uh, go into oh. uh, quarantine and to shut down. Oh. So we never got to, you know, perform that. They did it like two years later, but oh my goodness. it was with a slightly different cast and there was a, a whole thing surrounding it. And, um, but yeah, I haven't That's been big. back, but like this is me doing photography uh, in New York um, for, you know, doing portrait photography for dancers and actors and singers um and doing you know performance photography of shows um and events um is a way for me to stay connected with my roots and stay connected with my friends mm -hmm. um like uh, the red carpet event that i did in october was uh, my really good friend that i grew up with uh, j armstrong johnson um he puts on a charity show every uh halloween um, season called mm -hmm. I Put a Spell on You. And um, it's like, it's all these like Broadway stars and all these like up and coming like choreographers, like my friend Mikey, um, my friend Ahmad produced it. Like, it's like this whole oh. thing. Like, you know, it, it was kind of like a Texas reunion. Um, well, we've all grown up like in here where I am, mm -hmm. and they've gone on to Broadway. And so it was like this whole like, you know, reunion of like, you know, texas uh performers that all came together and we're all doing different things but still in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. um and so i was photographing and you know my friend mikey was choreographing and jay was you know it's a show he was starring in it um and uh amanda his best friend we grew up together as well she was you know she played mary because they were the sanderson sisters and they kind of host the show um and then ahmad you know was doing more like back-end stuff than like it's really really cool to be able to participate um in this community that i've grown up in that i love while also you know being mindful of my own physical limitations now mm. um with the psoriatic arthritis and, and dancing because i was dancing free. Is, what does that mean I can't psoriatic arthritis it. is <laughs> uh, it's um so psoriasis um is one of the the presentations of it and so i get like a dry patch here in my in, in my eyebrows and my scalp um is where the psoriasis shows up itself um but it feels like your joints are on fire mm -hmm. um especially like in the mornings okay. um and like you know when you get the flu or something and you're your joints just ache and your muscles ache and everything feels like it's just burning and that's what I think. And so, um, yeah. And so, uh, that, and it's, and it's flare up. So it's, a, it's an autoimmune, um, uh, disease and it's genetic. Um, and typically it's triggered, you know, the first time by, uh, you know, by uh, some other virus. So in this case, it was COVID, um, that triggered it. Oh my God. And that so it's horrible. It really is. It really is. And it's not because of COVID. Like it can be triggered by the flu. It can be triggered by, um, you know, by a bad cold, it can be triggered by, I think by a bacterial infection, but I'm not sure. Um, but like a bad illness is what can trigger it because it sends your immune system into overdrive and then basically opens like a little trap door for that psoriatic arthritis to, uh, to kind of like enter in or escape or emerge from, if you will. So, um, I don't really, it's not bad. I don't really suffer from it, but I can't dance like I used to. But I get to participate in these things still oh. and, and and not be sore the next day. Oh, that's good. <laughs> no, I don't have to audition for things. I hate auditions. Yeah, and yeah. you're still around all the, the talented people. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's, oh. Oh, what is, I think we already touched on it. What is your favorite song to sing or listen to during a breakup? <laughs> 
to to listen to would be uh, happiness amplified um and a song called um all right now um both of those are by above and beyond okay um when i'm in the angry phase of a breakup um it's uh, uh you, you want to know yeah no, I was more sad. Uh -huh. um and then like listen by beyonce from dream girls oh. Oh, yeah. um that is beautiful and uh and then if i want to make myself cry like if i'm if i'm like i haven't had a good i love crying <laughs> but like if i haven't had like a good like booger cry yeah. in a while i will um i will actually <laughs> throw on my adele album. oh yeah you gotta love adele yeah Voice. and the particularly the song uh to be loved mm. um and this is because there's a lyric in it and I'm probably going to butcher it because I'm not singing it. But, um, I mean, it starts out, you know, I built a house for love to grow. Mm. And that's very, very, like, the root of, like, you know, my emotions surrounding the breakup. Like, I built yeah. all of this and, you know, it felt invaded and, you know, yeah. and all of that. And then I was, I was, <laughs> yeah, and I was removed from it. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I, I don't want to say because it upset him. Then the other day I said, you know, kicked out, I was kicked out, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, it was not by choice that I moved. And so I, I feel that, you know, it was very, very, you know, kicked out of my own home. Yeah, that's the thing. It was not, none of it was, none of it was my choice. None of it was up to me. Um, and so that, and then at the end, um, towards the end, she talks about, um, I will choose to lose, or she says, to be loved, um, and love, uh, uh, by the highest counts, um, uh, is a sacrifice I choose to lose and something else, but like it's that I choose. I choose to lose that's like that is really ingrained in me because when you enter into a relationship you have to enter into it with the idea of, of impermanence this is not permanent mm. it, be, it, it might be like it has potential to be um but you know with the expectation of it being forever this happily ever after bullshit <laughs> um I've, I've always been against like um and they lived happily ever after what the fuck does that mean first of all <laughs> secondly no they didn't yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean no if a, if a couple never has like ruptures there's something wrong they don't care about each other yeah true happily ever after does not exist exactly. um it's actually i'm writing a book and the end of it is and they live happily ever after and then it's like marked out like by hand um <laughs> and then it's it's my handwriting that just says and they lived dot 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 yeah um and it's kind of like a memoir of like all of this yeah that's, that's happened after <laughs> um and and they lived and it's not and i lived it's yeah. they, like he's continuing on with his his life that he's chosen mm -hmm. and i'm continuing on like i choose to lose it's a sacrifice but i'm choosing this to be loved mm -hmm. and to love in return mm -hmm. it's a sacrifice mm -hmm. and you know we have to go into it knowing that like there's potential like th this has equal potential for heartbreak as it does for you know for longevity for you know having for being for life um and that's it's a hard reality for people to accept um this till death do us part shit Good luck. it's toxic yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's toxic i hate it that is. like we wrote it is. we wrote our own vows and we didn't put in there and this is before we um even knew what consensual non-monogamy was we were married in 2014 um wow you know we did not have in our vows that like any of that possessive like um you know, the only have eyes for you or like you and only you and like, 
um, and we didn't have the till death of us part in there. And that was subconscious. We had no intention of obviously getting a divorce. Yeah. And I'm not saying people should go into relationships with the intention of doing that, but knowing that you're choosing to have to you're choosing to have potential heartbreak mm -hmm. and if we're prepared for that if we know that going in um relationships are a lot you get to be a lot more mindful and you get to cherish these moments and then should that relationship end it's i don't want to say it's not unexpected but it's not it's less of a it's less of a feeling like a limb was cut off type yeah. of thing yeah. it's a this is what i signed up for this is this was it's kind of like a um like a warning label like consuming this product may cause cancer mm -hmm. like like choosing to fall in love with somebody or choosing to not that choosing to pursue a relationship with somebody that you've fallen in love with consuming this prod this product may lead in heart may cause heartbreak mm -hmm. and we go okay you know, tanning beds can, you know, have a high risk of, you know, getting skin cancer. Everybody knows that. It's disclosed. Mm -hmm. um, you have to sign something, but people do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like relationships. Like, you have potential for heartbreak. Would you, do you, do you want to continue? Yes or no? <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And That's so exactly you can, is. yeah. And so it's not, it, at that point, it's not something that's taken from you. Mm -hmm. um it's something that that was always there um you know and it's not unrealistic it's not like how could this happen <laughs> like, so you won't be yeah, as no. devastated at the end yeah exactly exactly and that's not to say like go through expecting like don't make it be a self-fulfilling prophecy like if you go into a relationship and this happens it's actually really important viewers listen up if you go into a relationship with the belief that you're going to be treated poorly, Ooh. therefore you act as if you've already been treated poorly, Ow. you're going to end up being treated poorly. Mm. So if you go into, if you've been cheated on in your past relationship or relationships and you go into a relationship expecting that person to cheat on you and then you treat them as if they already have, uh, and then you're surprised when they do yeah that's a self-fulfilling prophecy no and that no <laughs> you know, I, i'm a witch no close you're a bitch like <laughs> <laughs> don't treat people as if they have already treated you poorly when they haven't yeah don't make people pay for the mistakes of somebody who didn't know how to love you properly and and you know any, if, if people take away anything that's it you know, from no, this. I, get, I, I get what you're know. saying, but a lot of the things, I think it takes time for you to, mm -hmm. and then like, for you to learn these new habits, because I, I think, yes. like you said, we bring them in and like, and we keep on doing and keep on doing. So what do we do to stop that? <laughs> to mm -hmm. stop these terrible habits or cycles and stuff. Yeah. And I mean, if, and that's an, also an invitation to look at yourself, because like, if, you know, five out of five, you know, exes all did the same thing or all like ended the relationship. All, all, all the reviews say you act like a, you know, a raccoon stuck in a trash bag when you have a fight. Odds are <laughs> you act like a raccoon stuck in a trash bag when you have yeah. a fight. And that's something that you need to look at on, you know, on a personal level. True. Um, also, take a look at, you know, the types of people that you are interested in. Are you interested in people that don't show interest in you? Yeah. Is that something that, you know, the, you know that you're attracted to? And so, like the chase mm -hmm. um, and the aloofness? And maybe don't pursue people that don't act like they're interested in you. Maybe, you know, go for the person over here that, like, very clearly is interested in you. You just, like, you don't like this, like they eat too loud mm. or like, you know, <laughs> something, something that can be worked on. Yeah. Yeah. And people will make these excuses and, and like this guy is awesome for you. Oh uh, no, he wears cowboy boots and striped shirts <laughs> or in turtleneck. Like, no, I can't, I can't do it. All he, all he eats is steak. Like I can't, 
Yeah, we need, we need to break some of these bad habits over here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because we look for, the, you know, it, and that's us, what the Gottmans call scanning for the negative instead of scanning for the positive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, that's not toxic positivity. It's things that actually exist. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, I love the way that this person is forward, that this person is authentic, that this, this person seems like really, like, you know, bold and really just like blunt to people mm -hmm. um but really they know what they want and they know what they don't like and they know what they do like and mm -hmm. they're not gonna people they're not people pleasers mm -hmm. and maybe that's a good authentic thing that i normally wouldn't go for um maybe i should try it because all my past relationships they fucking hid shit from me and they like people pleased until they resented me because they didn't like italian food and i always wanted to eat italian food because they said oh my god i love italian food <laughs> when we first started dating to people please to impress me and then it comes to find out three years later after three years of eating italian food i fucking hate italian food mm -hmm. no wonder you hate me <laughs> <laughs> the craziness <laughs> yeah and but if you know somebody up front i fucking hate italian food we're not going there oh absolutely i'll go have italian food like by myself um or like with friends or with another partner like mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. um that's not a big deal let's go have sushi oh my god i love sushi great so do i authentically I mm -hmm. really do love sushi. Let's go. Yeah. You know, so maybe take a look at the people that, you know, that you're pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, but also look at the common denominator. True. Why does everybody end up ending the relationship like this? True. Very, very true. Yeah. Yep. And that's what a therapist therapy, will help. Therapy. Like, <laughs> that'll help lead you there. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. We need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so can you tell us about your school bus that you guys had and what you used it for? Do you guys still have it? Um, I have it. I got it in the divorce. Um, oh. it is still on his property. Um, but, uh, um, a lot of my stuff is in there right now, but, um, the bus, it was a, a full on school bus, all the seats, it was a 72 seater, um, you know, in yellow, uh, and, you know, we, you know, drove it home uh, from uh, like South Texas and uh, uh, took all the seats out and did learn how to weld. Um, we learned how to do all these things, you know, did, you know, murals, I did murals on the outside. Um, it's like an ongoing project. Um, finished up the inside uh, partially. It's got two queen size beds, a couch, um, wow. you know, a full counter sink, you got um, composting toilet, a, yeah, um, it's there's an Instagram. It's Soulbird, S O U L B I R D. It's named oh. after um, one of India Ari's songs. Mm -hmm. um, Soulbird Drive. Okay. It's all, all one word um, on Instagram, and it's uh, um, yeah, we took it on it, and this is the one of my happy mem happiest yeah. memories from the marriage is we drove that bus um, from Dallas to Sedona to Colorado, to Wyoming, um, to Yellowstone National Park, and then drove it down um, the West Coast uh, through Yosemite, um, through uh, Giant Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, through Joshua Tree, through the Mojave Desert, um, through, we drove through San Francisco, and buses that long do not belong in San Francisco with hills like that, because, oh. like... Yeah, because, like, when you get to the bottom of the hill, like, the ass end of the bus would, like, scrape the hill. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's why there's short buses everywhere in San Francisco. It was, like, oh. ooh, it, was, it was sketchy, for sure. But, yes, um, yeah. Um, but, yeah, we've, you know, driven it, you know, everywhere, you know, on the west half of the United States. And, um, yeah, it's super comfortable, obviously diesel but it's um, everything electric on the inside is powered by solar panels on did the it top. have air, air conditioning um, nope yes. okay when you guys were traveling was uh, hopefully not during the summer was it um one time it was okay um yeah it was uh it was in may okay um and we went to the grand canyon uh for my ex-husband's birthday oh, no. and I mean, it was hot as fuck <laughs> um, but you know all the the windows roll down and um and we had like fans and stuff in there but um they have rv uh ac units um that can handle the inverters can handle the voltage of those um so when i finish it out i'm going to be installing one of those and we've got a or i have a um 
a wood burning stove that's about this big wow. uh, in there that vents out the top um, for heat and all that. So, yeah, you guys did it it's big. completely livable. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you guys take people with you or was it just you two traveling together? Um, it was just us two on that that really long road trip. Oh. Um, but uh, like we took one of my best friends, Colton, um, uh, for the, the trip to the Grand Canyon. Wow. Um, and uh and yeah it's it can sleep one day <laughs> like six people seven people comfortably wow. um and there's a, a shower in there and all that it's really cool like not having to like stop places to go to the bathroom because like you just, it's like an rv you can just use yeah. you know the bathroom while it's moving and there's a window and you can like wave at people while you're shutting them the toilet. <laughs> i love it i want to i can't wait to see it on instagram mm-hmm. yeah, yeah this sounds like fun. really really lots of fun travel yeah. like that mm-hmm. cool yeah I, that, that sounds so fun well, let's see okay i guess i went down okay <laughs> i hate when i jump back and forth mm-hmm. oh okay do you still garden have you learned anything through having a garden so the garden uh the greenhouse we built um during uh during lockdown um and that was a meditation practice for me um i grew uh, you know blueberries and had a lemon tree in there uh, lots of different types of lettuce um lavender basil rosemary mint um grew all sorts of peppers and tomatoes and um and all of this Mm-hmm. Um, but that's at the house, obviously, okay. and I don't live there anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and we had Aww. chickens and, uh, you know, and I had to leave all that behind. Um, so I don't have that anymore. Um, it was kind of, Aww. you know, sad and poetic because yeah. the end of the relationship, nobody was tending to the, oh. um, I lost the will really to tend to the greenhouse. Oh. Um, and at, I would, I went out there like the day before I moved out and everything was dead in there except for the lavender. And it was blooming with all these, um, with all these purple lavender flowers. And I clipped them off and brought them with me because okay. everything in there was dead except for that. That's so um, and I've, yeah. And I've dried them out. And, um, oh. and, uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's- um, but it was poetic mm-hmm. and I kind of like saw myself as these, as these flowers, like everything is, and it's it goes back to the impermanence of a relationship and i looked around and i was like okay you know i attended to these things i watered them i grew them from seeds um and they grew into something that would nourish me that like that you know i enjoyed doing and then suddenly it stopped being tended to and it's no more and that's just how plants work it's also how relationships work. If we don't tend to them, if we don't, you know, if we don't give them a little bit of water, a little bit of sun, if we just give them one or the other, and you know, not both, they're not going to make it. That's true. It doesn't mean that they weren't, you know, that doesn't mean that they didn't produce fruit, mm-hmm. that they didn't bring you enjoyment when they were alive when it happened. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that's really sad. What, what about the chickens? Did you guys used to um, eat the eggs? Are mm-hmm. they? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, we were all, all three of us actually were um, vegetarian. Okay. And so, like when a when a chicken would uh, pass away of old age, um, we bury. We had a big old chicken graveyard in the backyard. Wow. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and there was there was only one chicken left. I don't know. And they might get more chickens, but I don't know if they're going to do that. Oh. Um, so, but yeah, she's old anyway. But. Aww. Mm-hmm. Or chicken, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it sounds like you guys had a, a a lot of fun together when you guys were together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a blast, and that's why I don't I don't hate him. And ever well, he never hit me. He never like never abused me. And it was just it, it was pretty. It was a hurtful. All divorces are hurtful. It was a pretty hurtful mm-hmm. divorce. Um, one on my end from my perspective because it was out of nowhere mm-hmm. um and i also yeah, had I like yeah that's even worse when you don't see it mm-hmm. yeah. and i i observations that i've made that 
again, like I said, I hope that they're both in this for the right reasons. Um, and it's just theory that I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to talk to them about it because you know it's their their choice, their relationship. I have no part in it. Yeah, I can have my thoughts about it, but it's not for me to like. And we have a lot of the same friends or a lot of same acquaintances, and it's not for me to mold a public opinion um, about them. Um, what I do hope is that again that they're happy mm-hmm. that's all i can hope for but then i hope they're happy successful um i hope that you know they're able to thrive um and i hope you know i hope they don't you know hurt each other emotionally or i guess and physically but i hope they don't hurt each other mm-hmm. um or one or the other i don't think they will mm-hmm. but if they do it's not my place it's not my job anymore to step in okay yep you're you're done with that situation Mm -hmm. Uh, what have you learned about relationships while traveling because it sounds like you've done a lot of traveling too you've lived like a really exciting life it sounds like (laughs) you've done Um, learning about relationships um while traveling i actually haven't traveled i mean i have traveled a lot Mm -hmm. um but uh, a lot of that travel was with my ex-husband mm-hmm. and like to, to Europe, to you know Paris, London, Wales, um, uh, Holland, and all of that, and Mexico a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I don't know if I've learned a lot about relationships from travel, okay? Because we would do a lot of stuff, you know, just us, and we wouldn't we wouldn't really like i don't want to say we wouldn't make friends wherever we went but like we didn't really go out places like we didn't meet other couples when when we were traveling it was very like uh, almost like go 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 um and uh, experiencing that together okay so yeah um uh, but i did learn you know traveling with a partner um is really important i would i would honestly travel with a partner before moving in with a partner or before um um, especially before marrying a partner because people when they travel are way different than they are at home um you know how does you know how do you travel you know i travel very like there's things i want to do but i'm not going to make an itinerary area like we have to be like in the car by this time and we have to be at this place by this time and this place by this time and then we have to do this then we have to go to this restaurant order this food and then we have to yeah. da, 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 da. and we have to go to like a and we're staying in a resort where everything is like you know whatever we don't even have to leave the resort um and so and that's not me no i want to go do like what locals do i want to go have like cool experiences i love history i want to go learn the history of wherever i'm at yeah. um and I want to go like walk around just like amongst like the people that live there and ask like recommendations. What's your favorite restaurant here? You've lived here for you know 80 years. What's your favorite restaurant? <laughs> um, like and th- that's how I travel. Some people that would drive me that shit. Mm-hmm. And so we're not compatible as far as travel is concerned. And that's where polyamory comes into play because you can have a partner that travels just like you do and you can go on trips with them because you're not going to enjoy trips with this person oh yeah i can see the positive so, sides of being poly yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> i can definitely see that <laughs> um what do you like most about your social media followers i get some of the coolest um dms uh from people um I sent out a, a uh, uh, either a story or a status or something on Facebook asking um, people to message me if I have ever hurt them, like if something I've done has ever hurt them. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was really, and this was like during the whole, like the hard part of like right after the you know I want a divorce thing. Mm-hmm. And I wanted like to be super raw and vulnerable with people mm-hmm. because, you know, he was telling me that, you know, about all these things that like the, that I would do that like ended up having like a negative effect on him. 
that I had no idea about. Like I, had, I had no idea that, it, that this affected you like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wanted to know, has any, with my friends and acquaintances, has anything I've ever done, you know, hurt uh, you? And someone that I haven't seen or talked to in over a decade um, messaged me mm-hmm. and um, they said, one night I posted on Facebook um, a status that wasn't a direct cry for help, but you recognized this is him talking to me, mm-hmm. but you recognized that it was a cry for help or it could have been. Mm-hmm. And you reached out to me and, you know, and you told me you know, whatever it was that I told him. And I had made plans to end my life that night. But because you reached out to me and told me what you told me, um, I didn't. And I'm so glad that I didn't. I'm married now, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wow. Um, and it was story after story after story. And, you know, people that I didn't even know, they're like, I see your, your stories on you know Instagram about relationships. And those stories alone have helped me and my partner, you know, mm-hmm. through some, you know, rough seasons. Um, and, you know, and, and thank you. And I'm like, y'all, this was not the exercise. <laughs> I even put in there, this is not an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, this is not an opportunity to tell me how awesome I am. Please. Mm -hmm. I want to know if I hurt any of you. Tell me what I did and why. And nobody would. Um, Everybody was telling me how awesome I am. And I was like, defeats the purpose. But anyway, um, it was, it was really important um, to, to hear, especially in a time where I was so hurt. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've got people that have, you know, followed me for years and years and years that, you know, that I've never met in person or that I've never like talked to or had a conversation with and that, you know, look at my stories and read my stories. And a lot of them are funny. A lot of them are like normalizing mental health and normalizing going to therapy. And like, I post a lot of like, you know, stuff about from a therapist perspective, like, you know, we're like scarfing down food between sessions. Like we're real people. And yeah, like how know, the other day I was harassing you, asking you about, uh, did you schedule? <laughs> and I and I, oh, I yeah, had yeah. to stop and realize, like, yeah, he does have a regular job. <laughs> he does have clients. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it seems like that. Like, um, you know, I had somebody uh, just yesterday um, message me and say, you know, you have really helped me, like, put into perspective that that my own therapist is a real person like Mm -hmm. that they might have anxiety that they and they become more relatable and that's why i'm so open on uh especially instagram first therapist that i've ever uh, heard of that said you're in a what's the term uh uh, i forgot the term Uh, what is it polyamorous right polyamorous yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah, oh god there's a whole like network of us oh really Mm -hmm. my podcast host um co-host um dr johnson um him and his husband are are both polyamorous um yeah there's a there's a lot of us um a lot of therapists like to stay um uh keep their private lives very very private yeah um uh i think i can say this because he's you know talked about it openly on his podcast but my friend in california dr robert duff um is also polyamorous and um you know very openly like um, you know, my wife's partner, like drew this sketch of us or drew this sketch of my wife and you know, blah, blah, blah. And is very open about that. And we're basically, you know, we're normalizing it for people. Um, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm, yeah, you're the first one that I've ever heard of, but it's yeah. eye opening once again, to hear that there's so many mm-hmm. therapists that are polyamorous. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And people look at polyamory and they have an initial like body reaction, like an, Oh my danger. Um, <laughs> and, or they go, you know, throubles never, never work out or, you know, um, non-monogamous relationships never work out. Um, the rate of, you know, uh, uh, relationships that end in, you know, that are polyamorous far lower um than monogamous relationships yeah i would think like are you saying that are you saying monogamous relationships don't fail (laughs) like yeah come on yeah so yeah Yeah, it's starting to make sense because they're you guys are more honest not you guys Mm -hmm. but you know i mean people who practice yeah yeah Mm -hmm. 
and you have rules or you guys talk about stuff beforehand <laughs> boundaries and yeah, yeah. Actually, it's, it's great it's wonderful mm -hmm. and i think that's and monogamous couples can also have that yeah like it's not just like open and clear communication is not exclusive to uh not monogamy but in monogamous couples can absolutely have that it's just we're kind of forced to it's like a, a requirement mm -hmm. for us at really is a requirement for monogamous people too there's really not a lot of differences um, so it's just more for, by nature us like entering into this relationship dynamic we're already accepting the fact that oh we need to make even more of an effort to communicate mm. because there's more people involved so i think that's where it's like it's more of a thing okay. when it needs to be a thing for everybody Mm -hmm. including monogamous people <laughs> yeah that's true we can, well, i know yeah most people they don't we don't discuss a lot of things until after the fact and that's the problem mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> yeah if you're up front and you have open communication i think mm -hmm. that helps out hey honey my secretary my new secretary at work uh gave me her number and asked if i wanted to go like to you know try in the bar mm -hmm. um you know down the street with her tomorrow night mm -hmm. like do you want to go or like can i you know would you mind if I went? Like, I'm, I'm not, you know, not interested in her romantically, just like making a new friend, you know, whatever, it's something like that. No, God, no. Because culturally, other partners are going to freak out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so there's that fear of that, like, of being honest. That when in, in polyamory, hey, my secretary gave me uh, her number and asked if I wanted to go um, to a bar. Uh, would you mind? Show me your picture. Like, <laughs> it's like, what she looked like. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very, that that's the difference um, yeah. between the two. I'm not saying all monogamous relationships are like that, mm -hmm. um, but most are, unfortunately. Yeah, true. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have a set price for your services? Yeah, I do. Uh, so my set price were, you know, the ones that are not sliding scale. Um, it's, uh, for the initial 80 minute intake session, it's 240. Um, and each 50 minute session after that is 175. Okay. Um, and that is far below average. Um, like my own therapist is 225, uh, for a 50 minute session. Okay. Um, every, every Thursday. Um, but oh. yeah, I, I like to keep my, you know, my price is lower than the average market price of, you know, wherever I'm at, um, uh, just for that accessibility. Um, but then also insurance wise, uh, what I can do is send what's called a super bill. Um, and this is because I don't fuck with insurance companies. Um, I send a super bill that's a diagnostic receipt essentially after the patient is paid, um, out of pocket. And then they take that receipt, send it to their insurance company and they reimburse the patient directly. Oh, okay. Um, before like usually up to like 80, 80 percent, 85 percent of the, uh, the cost or whatever the copay would have been. Um, and so, uh, that's kind of a way, you know, around that. Um, but yeah, those are my prices. Pretty, oh. pretty set. Okay. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on breakup parties? I loved this question when I read it, um, because I've never heard of it called that. And so I want to, um, there's two things that I thought of. Mm -hmm. One was I had, um, two patients, mm -hmm. um, where we really, really worked on, um, on their divorce. They were no longer compatible. The two of them, they just, their, their ideals, they were not about their dynamic. were not, they were not seeing eye to eye. Mm -hmm. Um, they were extremely good friends though. Like I could tell that they really loved each other. They did not love being married to each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I suggested to them going on an anti honeymoon, oh. <laughs> like a, a divorce honeymoon mm -hmm. go to, and they, they went to Disney together, oh. like as like a final trip, like oh. together as a married couple. Oh, wow. Um, and they went on this like anti honeymoon thing mm -hmm. and they did like the robes and like the rose petals and, and all of that, like had the hotel or the resort or whatever, do it. And, um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, they, 
uh, ended up having like a photo shoot of them both like drinking like separate like bottles of champagne from the bottle um and all of that and so it was it was really cute um how they did it and they made it, they made it fun because mm-hmm. a divorce doesn't have to be traumatic it doesn't have to be you know sometimes yeah. it inherently it's especially when kids are involved mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to be um as long as both people are willing it's the key willing to witness and admit their own parts yeah. in the ending of the relationship mm-hmm. and and what went wrong on their end there's no point in talking about what we're, what the other person did wrong mm-hmm. <laughs> what is that going to do it's just going to make us resent them even more mm-hmm. and but if we can look at what you know where we fell short where we didn't show up then maybe we can you know remedy that in future relationships our future relationships can thrive based off of us admitting the part that we played in a relationship that ended well i'm glad Um, you're you're talking about that on our show because like i mentioned repeatedly a lot of our viewers are very upset and angry and so it's nice to hear that some people can get divorced be angry yeah be angry you can do you can all, you can witness yourself in the part that you played in uh the relationship that ended mm-hmm. and be angry at the same time okay i was fucking livid livid, yeah. livid at how some of the things were handled yeah um like to the point of like you know i had this big like uh canvas print of uh a photo of the bench uh, on a mountainside in japan in kyoto mm-hmm. where um where he proposed to me um mm-hmm. in 2013 and it was beautiful it's this beautiful photograph um of the it's just a little wooden bench on, on a mountainside looking over kyoto wow. and um i burned it yeah. in like a like a cord cutting ceremony type of thing yeah. i burned it under a full moon like yeah um i was absolutely angry it was was it cathartic absolutely Mm -hmm. i also burned one of my journals um that i had written like poetry and song lyrics um specifically dedicated to him and my my wedding ring was actually a wooden ring and it had like different like crystals and gems like embedded in it like crushed Mm -hmm. up um and i attached that i tied that to that that journal and i burned all of it i watched my wedding ring like i'll send you a picture of it i watched my wedding ring go up go up in flames <laughs> that should be and, that should be in one of our stories on instagram <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll absolutely send it to you but um oh it was it was so cathartic and you know if you can find symbolism in things it helps with the anger because with the and if you can look at that anger like your viewers you know absolutely be angry i'm not telling you not to be angry i want you to be angry but i also want you to look at what you're angry at and why and is it actually anger or is it hurt do you or is it your body feeling like it's in danger like it it has had something taken from it Mm -hmm. um there's so many like layers to to anger are you feeling frustrated are you feeling betrayed are you feeling used are you feeling um lied to are you feeling you know there's so many different things that are behind anger anger is just like the the easy emotion we've studied you know three thousand people and asked them to name emotions as you're feeling them and on average three emotions oh my were, were all all that people could um could identify and name as they were feeling them and it was mad sad and glad <laughs> out of all so yeah yeah, all all the emotions Mm -hmm. um angry sad happy were the only ones that on average that people could identify as they were feeling and then there's so many more and that's where neurolinguistics comes into play because you know you know and with anger in and of itself a lot of times anger is just another form of pain so yep i believe yeah. yeah it's true once again that's why we need therapists <laughs> yep, exactly <laughs> now we have a tiktok viewer now we have a tiktok viewer by the name of bean yvonne and she says yep. she asked what outings can we do to soothe the holiday longing but keep envy at bay 
Okay. Uh, to soothe holiday longing, but keep envy at bay. Depends on what you're envious about. And I'm assuming okay. that, um, that they are, um, recently divorced. Um, if this is your, this is my first holiday, if this is your first holiday, um, you know, twins, um, you can spend, absolutely spend it with friends. Okay. If you have people near you, um, you know, create a network if not there are absolutely divorce like i don't call them support groups but it's kind of the like divorce clubs almost like a first wives club mm -hmm. um where you know the, the divorced people all hang out with each other and it's non-romantic like it's not like it's not a big like hookup club <laughs> it's just people that are that you know are recently divorced or have like healed from divorces and you know know that like that you that we again going back to the beginning we are a tribal species we it's okay to need people needing other people is not a weakness mm -hmm. and this is something that my ex-husband's fiance one of the reasons that um that he broke up with me was i kept expressing needs and he you know told me explicitly that um that i shouldn't need people i should be able to provide uh, these things for myself um it really that sucks because i think a lot of society tries to say you need to be independent you need to do this and that but as i've gotten mm -hmm. older i realize like how much we do need other people and like how much they yeah can help us and yeah and we we separated into needs and wants mm -hmm. no more no more of that yeah, because yeah. you know we try to justify it with like is this a need or a want yeah um <laughs> because a need is is needy a yeah. need is like essential a need is like you know especially for emasculated people you know a need is a weakness like i oh, okay. you know i'm hyper independent i don't need anybody right um but then a want sounds what selfish like it sounds like an indulgence mm -hmm. um no like i want quality time i also need quality time yeah i i need physical touch i don't you know, touch starvation is a thing yeah um okay. it releases you know a 20 second hug releases oxytocin in the brain um which you know directly combats uh anxiety and depression mm. um and it's 20 seconds because it takes 20 seconds for oxytocin to metabolize in the body mm -hmm. so your friends your partners like hug them when they get home from work or when they walk in the door or when you can see them passing in the hallway 20 second hug yeah. get that little boost of oxytocin and like and go about your day mm -hmm. um and you know, we, we need people and that's okay. Needing, needing people doesn't make it needy. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would say is find a group of people. If not, um, make your own memories. Okay. I have this little rosemary, like Christmas tree. That's just like a decoration for my, my zoom session. Uh -huh. But then I have, um, a tree in the living room. Uh, my ex-husband and I used to make this big, like hallmark deal out of like putting the tree up and I would make like my badass hot chocolate and, mm all that and it was it was a really cool um experience um that we shared every year um and i'm a singer and like i have a christmas album that's that i've since taken off of itunes so i'm very much a scrooge this year but like oh. there's a christmas tree completely um undecorated oh um and i've you know i've unplugged the lights like the lights haven't been on since the day you know i put it up um i tried uh, but it's it's also okay to not be in the holiday spirit especially if this okay. is your first mm -hmm. um if it's going to remind you of you know these good times that you had that you no longer have um maybe express gratitude for those good times okay. um and then make new memories okay okay don't let something my aunt told me she's the one that made me put the tree up uh, and she said uh I'm not going to say his name, but you know, my ex-husband does not have a monopoly on, on Christmas, on, on holidays, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's, that there's, there's truth to that. I, I don't need to let him make me sad, mm -hmm. um, on, on Christmas. Like uh, my birthday is December 21st. Like I'm a Christmas baby. Yeah. I love Christmas, but this year I don't. And I'm allowing myself to not be in the Christmas spirit okay. and I'm not judging myself for it. I'm okay. because my body's very much fighting against wanting to be in the Christmas spirit. <laughs> and it's doing that for a reason. It's like, <clears throat> you're doing so good. Like 
you don't need you don't need this unnecessary thing to you know bring up all this other like the stuff that you've already processed yeah we don't need to regress if mm. if you're feeling like you don't you're not in the holiday spirit do not force yourself because then you're going to start resenting the holidays i anticipate next christmas and you know i'll be in new york um it'll be snowing it will be you know i've been in texas it, we've had snow and christmas like once since i've been alive mm. i'm next year gonna have a white christmas no i hear like um some of my customers they tell me they come to la and they said oh uh, la christmas is nothing like a new york christmas because mm -hmm. they have like macy's decorated and big display oh, yeah. so i think you're gonna have an exciting christmas yeah yeah i'm i'm saving my my holiday spirit for yeah. uh for when i have you know the the christmas that i've like that I've always like tried to recreate. Like I, I bought a fucking snow machine oh. one year for for our for my old house um, that I had going in the yard every day because um, I'm trying to like create this like oh. this no, just Christmas I mean, that doesn't exist yeah. here. No, no, I, I I totally feel for you because I I really like hearing all these, um, what do you call it? memories? I I, I, mm -hmm. I just take hats off to you because I think it'd be difficult. Because for me, I guess I'm probably codependent too. I'd be so attached to that life or those mm -hmm. activities. So, I mean, that's a really tough thing to get through. And hats off to you for doing as well mm -hmm. as you're doing without throwing a brick through the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I just want people to let themselves be be sad like i'm letting myself be be sad through this like i don't want to put i don't want to decorate the tree yeah. that, that, and that's that's my one thing like mm -hmm. i'll put up lights on the outside of the house i'll go like you know where i live is actually called grapevine and we're the christmas capital of texas and mm -hmm. so like i you know i took you know my boyfriend and his partner out you know and we're it's oh, like nice. it's texas wine country is Ooh. you know whatever and so we went like a little like winery tour and there's like gaudy ass lights everywhere oh no um and, and it's yeah no it's fine it's great um but it's just the tree like that, that's that's my that's my boundary like yeah. i'm i'm not i'm not ready and i'm i'm letting myself not be ready and i'm not judging myself for not being ready so yeah, if you don't have to the tech, you have your new memories with your new boyfriend so that exactly and if the your the tiktok um commenter mm -hmm. um you know it, I, I want them to know that you know don't if you're not in the holiday spirit you don't have to force yourself to be okay um you know just allow yourself to pretend it's september or january <laughs> pretend it's january yeah if you want New to year. yes mm-hmm uh, do you have any last words that you would like to share with an ex? Some people do. Some people just have sign language or some people. <laughs> oh, my. Um, no, I, I would tell him. Um, I actually, I forgot that you were going to ask this question, but I made a note after my therapy session today, even though I didn't even talk about my marriage in the session mm -hmm. but i write down like thoughts that i have as i have them and i wrote down i'm thankful that i didn't know the last time we kissed was going to be our last Ooh. yeah yeah because that's hard mm -hmm. that's really weird. if i had known that it was going to be our last that would have broken me yeah but the last time we the last time we kissed i don't i don't remember it and i'm glad okay <laughs> It's like uh, your yeah. your parents you know, picked you up for the last time once. We Ooh. didn't know what. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's really, really, and, really hard. Yeah, and so I'm glad I didn't know that the last yeah. time we kissed was our last. Yeah, you. Mm -hmm. And that I hope he's happy. Okay. Well, I'm glad you look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Yeah. Otherwise, I would be so consumed with. You know, I, I let universe do whatever it's gonna do okay um and whether that means like letting people's actions play out and whatever you know consequences or results or whatever um you know it can be looked at that way um but i don't have to add to that mm -hmm. 
what I, I don't have control over what they do. I don't have control over what, you know, how they feel. What I have control over is, is yeah, I have my reactions to things, but that's, that's all. Everyone has a reaction. My responses are what I choose. Yeah. And so I can choose to respond in a way that, you know, I, there's no reason for me to hold animosity anymore because that doesn't feel good. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not good for me. Like I had a bleeding ulcer, um, from all the stress. And so if I, if I feed that by being petty, cause I'm, I'm past the, the anger point now. Um, if we'd had this interview, you know, four or five months ago, it would have been a completely different interview. Yeah. And maybe not. And like you saw the other interview that I did, it was still, you know, pretty, uh, pretty cordial mm -hmm. and professional, but, um, you know, I'm past that and anything that's like pettiness, it's all coming from ego and I don't, I don't need to feed that part of ego. Like I have some really good opportunities and I'm thankful that, you know, that he called for the divorce because I wouldn't, I would never have met my boyfriend. I never would have met his partner. I never would have, you know, I never would have, you know, reconnected with Anthony, my best friend. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in the way that I did, had it not been for this divorce, I never would have reconnected with my group of friends here. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Dr. Johnson and his husband, Rob, um, and you know, and all their friends, uh, they're fucking incredible. I met um, that just <laughs> I wouldn't have met Liza. Yeah. And all, all their friends are, are my friends. I never would have met Liza and I never would have like done all these things and experienced all these things in such a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Had I not been, had we not gotten divorced, mm -hmm. so I would have been stuck in the same cycle of codependency. Yeah, and it's not a, a dig on him. It's all that part I had also equal control over. Um, but I never would have gone, you know, met my therapist that I have now, uh, who's incredible, um, Dr. Carissa Collins. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody's in the Dallas area and interested, um, and you know, <laughs> yeah, um, I wouldn't have this post traumatic growth or post traumatic mm -hmm. wisdom um that i can relay to my patients like it's made my practice my therapy practice you know it's elevated that way now i have like you know to draw personal experience to draw for, for all these opportunities and that would not have happened um had you know had i not you know gotten divorced it, it is liberating it is freeing as long as you take the steps you have to, your, your viewers have to take the steps and be willing to go outside of your comfort zone and admit to yourself, you're not in that relationship anymore. You get to, and this is not even a new chapter. It's a whole ass other book. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. this is not, you're, yeah, you're not starting a new, a new chapter. I'm glad that you said, Oh no, it's not a new chapter. It's a whole new book. That's mm -mm. And it's yeah, a whole ass new book. It's yeah, not even that a last part is cut off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, very yeah. true. Do so you, that's the go ahead oh, oh i was gonna go move on to the next question like mm -hmm. go ahead do you have any shout outs for anyone um i mean i've already given shout outs to, I know you sure have. uh the, the people that have uh that have really you know really been there for me um like my, my other best friend, uh, Katie, who's uh, an, an airman on Dover Air Force Base, four days after the divorce conversation, I made my first solo plane ride. Oh my god! First plane ride by myself um, oh my up to um, up to stay with her for a few days on the Air Force Base, and oh um, I don't think even to the moment. Yeah, she's I helped her through her divorce as well um, years and years ago, but so she understood. Um, and um, she knew that, and she left me the fuck alone, uh, you know, up in, up in that room. And, you know, we cooked together. I, you know, cried. I saw, you know, one of the things that really, really fucking hurt me. Because, mm -hmm. like I told you, I had been asking, like, making requests for, like, a date night instead of remodeling this house that doesn't need remodeling. Um, and, like, 
I was always turned down for, you know, for date nights with like with the three of us and, mm-hmm. you know, all these, all these bids for connection, I was always turned down. Like That's I was cool. being ridiculous in my, yeah. in my requests. And then while I was up in Delaware, um, I, you know, I saw on Facebook cause you know, what do breakups do? You know, it makes us attached to our ex's Facebook pages. Yeah. So on Facebook that they went to, um, our f- fucking favorite restaurant oh. um and then went bowling okay. um and that is something that is very specifically something that i wanted to do and they did it while i was gone after the divorce conversation and oh. that was one of the most painful like the events of yeah. of the breakup for me mm-hmm. i i had my first bathroom floor moment um that when I, when I saw that and she was there for the, she actually left work early, um, to, uh, to come back to her house. And I was on the floor, like I, I wasn't good, sis. Yeah. Um, and did you have uh, a friend like that there though for you? Yeah. Yeah. She knew, um, I didn't even ask her to come back. I just sent her like screenshots of it. And then I sent her a picture of me crying. Cause I, I'm a photographer. I photograph emotion. <laughs> um, and so I sent her that and like 10 minutes later, you know, she's coming through the door and she doesn't say anything. Aww. She very much knows how to listen to understand rather than listen to respond. Mm-hmm. And she was just there. Like she didn't give advice. She let me, you know, she let me lay it all out and she was like what do you want to do mm-hmm. and you know, i don't remember i was like i want to burn the fucking house down is what i want to do she's like i can't let's do that <laughs> <laughs> like i don't have bail money so <laughs> yeah right I can't let you do that mm-hmm. um but uh but yeah she was there for me um and uh and and my family they've all been you know, there for me, uh, you know, and always will be, um, they're all local here. Um, and then, uh, my friends, you know, Josh and Braden, um, always walk, like welcomed me into their home they were, they and give me the code to their door. And they were just like, just walk in if you need, nice. you know, to be around people, just walk in. Okay. Just yell at the you know, staircase. If, so we don't get startled. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love them dearly and it's, you know, it, yeah, it's a big network of people that knew how to show up for me and knew how to hold space for me. Mm-hmm. Um, that I don't, I don't even know if they realize how important they are. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah. And my therapist. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad that you have that big support group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, you've been through some difficult times. Even though you can handle it pretty well, I mean, and I know you've had your bouts yeah. angry, being angry, but yeah, you've handled a lot. Mm-hmm. If you ask me, yeah, um, it's yeah, it has been a lot. Yeah, it's a big deal to be going through a divorce and be married for so many years, and then to see mm-hmm. with someone else. But I mean, you've handled it really well, and you're. Um, you're inspirational to our viewers too, because I, I'm sure that when they mm. watch you and your the way you handle things, it might make them think differently or try to make yeah. different choices. <laughs> and that, that, I mean, that being said, um, if they uh, my practice completely virtual, um, and so I'll be you know working up in New York as well. Um, you know, if they you know need a professional to talk to, a therapist to talk to. I've literally like been there. I will sit there in the dark with you because I'm not scared of the dark anymore because I came out the other side. Okay. Um, and I will like walk with them through that darkness. Absolutely. Um, and, um, soulbird wellness.com, okay. uh, is my, is my website where they can uh, find that on my Instagram or, or whatever. Yeah. That's what I wanted um, to end with. Well, where can we find out more about you? Like I want to mm-hmm. see this buzz i want to see some of your pictures <laughs> from the burning ring i want to see some garden pictures and i definitely mm-hmm. see pictures when you get to new york as well absolutely yeah. all that's going to be on my instagram my photography instagram is mundell modern pixels um thomas mundell phd is my instagram and then um soulbirdwellness.com is how people can go and request their first appointment 
and um yeah okay <laughs> Thank you for that. So now everybody that's watching, you go ahead and follow Thomas Mundell on Instagram. And he has mm -hmm. a podcast. I, I was listening to his podcast. You guys are going to love it. And I can't wait to hear more episodes. Mm -hmm. It's called Navigating Chaos. Yeah, I like that one. I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm already hooked. <laughs> awesome. Yay. <laughs> but I would love so, to be on YouTube, too. Why have you decided not to be on YouTube? I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> I don't, I don't have anything to talk about unless I have somebody asking me questions. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll see more of you on online as Maybe. well. Since you Maybe. have such a fan club on Instagram. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm going to, <laughs> right? I'm yeah. going to start um, <laughs> writing my book when I get to New York and okay. maybe... Maybe I'll start a YouTube channel. It's not okay. something that I'd ever consider doing, but okay. um, but yeah, I might do that. Okay. I know. We would love that. Well, thank you so much awesome. for being a guest, Thomas. Like, um, we loved hearing your story. We love hearing about your business that you're in and uh, how many people you're touching with just your story of your life and the different things that you've done. And like, you've done it all. Like I said, you've been in entertainment. Like, I don't, I just, you've done it all. <laughs> It's all ADHD, baby. I get bored easily. <laughs> no, it's amazing, actually. Like, um, I, I just can't imagine all the different things that you've done and the places you've been and mm -hmm. the gardens and everything. I think it's really mm -hmm. phenomenal. Like, your life is amazing. And we're, I'm so yeah. happy to meet you. And I hope you have, like, um, despite you don't really want to celebrate Christmas, I hope you have a ha happy um, rest of the December. <laughs> yes yeah i'm gonna you know i'm uh one of my other best friends that when i said earlier that i choreographed the show in october um is from here he's coming to town and um putting on uh a uh, concert at my favorite bar it's a gay bar in dallas called alexander's okay. um and uh it's called carols for a cause and i will be singing a yes. song in it but i'm going to be photographing it but it okay. is the night of my birthday december, december 21st okay. um and it's uh it's benefiting promise house um it's uh under promise house helps underprivileged kids um uh do things like theater do things like you know the, all these you know things these career building things that they normally wouldn't have access to mm. and so it's it's benefiting that um i keep telling him it's my, my birthday concert and oh, he's like yes and it's your going away party so <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be a great cause and it's gonna be a fun day for your mm -hmm. birthday yeah yeah it's gonna be fun so if anybody is local um they are more than welcome to come out and uh yeah we do uh, have support some texas the viewers actually i know for sure we've actually had some other uh guests from texas so hopefully they listen awesome. at 10 absolutely. absolutely thank you Thank you for spending like three hours with me. <laughs> three and a half. Yeah. I was like, I got I told you. Yeah, I told you, get ready for hours. one. It's so amazing. I didn't realize that I had that it, I had that many questions, but I was like, they're all great to get information from you. Absolutely. And I didn't prepare any answers. Like I read through, I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I like to get like off the off the cuff, off the fly answers. Um but uh yeah, I told you get ready for long winded answers. <laughs> it's all good because like our viewers are going to eat this up i'm telling you they're going to love hearing your story and then all the information that you help them with like healing mm -hmm. and uh alcoholism and addictions like so many mm -hmm. viewers uh, need assistance in those areas so we're so happy to have you and for such a good amount of time th that we mm -hmm. need i also have a book recommendation for anybody interested okay. um, in learning more about polyamory okay. um and that book is called Poly Secure by Jessica Fern. Okay. Um, and then anybody, you know, starting new relationships or in already existing relationships, um, I highly recommend a new book by John, Drs. John and Julie Gottman. Um, it's called The Left Prescription, uh, Seven Days to More uh, Intimacy and Connection. Mm. And it's, um, it's, a, it's almost like a workbook and things that small immediately actionable things that you know individuals and relationships can do to strengthen a relationship and it's like do you know notice small things often um it's uh you know scanning for the positive rather than the, rather than the negative because like mm -hmm. we do things for each other all the time they go unnoticed but as soon as we do something wrong it's pointed out sure. so point out the 
point out the good things as well. Um, and it's uh, uh, ask for what you need, um, express your needs in a, in a very specific way. Um, you know, and it's all about, you know, uh, make contact, the whole hugging thing. Like, and, you know, you just add on, you do just day one on day one, and then day two, you add day one and day two, and then day one, two, and three on the third day. And then just, and it really helps strengthen and build relationships, whether those relationships are new or, you know, established. So, um, polysecure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like polysecure by Jessica it. Fern. Um, uh, the Love Prescription by John and Julie Gottman, and then What Happened to You by uh, Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah okay. are my the three books that I would recommend uh, for people. So, okay. well, we'll definitely check them out. We'll take any help that awesome. we can get. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, that's part of the accessibility thing too. With um, with therapy, is you know a lot of times you know, and I offer recommendations for books. I will, if somebody can't, you know, pay for therapy, even like a sliding scale, I'll say, okay, you know, here's some books I, I would love for you to read. Um, you know, I do, uh, I've been thinking about, uh, recording some workshops, like here's, you know, uh, a workshop that you can watch, take notes whenever you want and to would pay to see that we would pay to see some of your workshops. Yeah. And I would, I would do these for people to like, you know, obviously it's not individualized therapy, mm -hmm. um, but it's things a lot like this interview where, yeah. you know, it's like a, you know, almost like a Ted talk type of thing. <laughs> yeah. You could definitely still um, get some helpful information out of them for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I would love so. to see that. And the awesome. workbooks, I'm like, we definitely need those and they make great holiday gifts as well. Absolutely. Send yeah. some to your exes. Yeah, exactly. That's a good idea. That's being. I'm nice. actually sending. Yeah, I'm actually sending them the uh, the love prescription as a um, as a genuine, not petty, mm -hmm. as a genuine uh, engagement uh, gift. That's so nice. Um, because I, I do want them to succeed. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're really nice about it, and I, 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 there are people that have been successful with being, you know, friends or associates mm -hmm. with their exes still. So. I never said I was going to be friends. Yeah, okay. I said I would like well, to. At least you're <laughs> but, but you're still cool. Yeah. And you're really nice. I would still consider you a friend, like, because you handle it yeah. very well. I suppose. Yeah. Um, but hurting people who hurt people doesn't make for less hurt people. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, all I can do is, is wish them, you know, I hope they're, I hope they succeed and I hope they're happy and that's success. So, yeah. Well, we want to make sure that you're okay because we know you. <laughs> I am. I'm says I am thriving. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, that that was so. Yeah. Liza Minnelli told me my eyebrows were fantastic. So. I know that that made the whole year worse. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, not everyone's gonna be so lucky to meet her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh, very many people. Anyway. Are. That was so cool. Yeah. Um, um, it was so nice to meet you. I'm gonna go eat dinner now. Oh yeah, I gotta go use the bathroom. <laughs> so there you, go. Nice there one you go. Yeah, we keep like popping our bags. <laughs> like, <we're laughs> back hurts too. All right. Well, you have a nice it's day. It's so nice meeting you. It's nice meeting you too. I love your purple. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, All right. Take care. I'll see you soon. All right. Bye, love. Bye.